Single Malt Drama, a Mafia Romantic Comedy, Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, Book 3, written by Catherine M. Hurst, narrated by Charlotte Claremont and Aaron Shedlock. Chapter 26 Nicolina I woke to the glorious aroma of bacon and coffee and Marco, specifically his lingering scent on the pillow. I chose my favorite of the three smells and nuzzled deeper under the covers. Good morning, sunshine. My husband kissed my forehead, the same as he'd done every day for the previous two months. Hungry? Peeking out from beneath the thin cotton blanket, I whispered, for you? We went three rounds last night and you had five orgasms. Now who is incorrigible? He chuckled. That was yesterday. I sat upright, let the covers fall to my lap, and frowned. Why are you wearing a suit? It had been ages since I'd seen him in anything except jeans or board shorts and a t-shirt. He looked good in the dark fitted trousers, blue dress shirt, and tie. Then again, with a body like his, he looked good in anything, and nothing at all. I have to go into New Orleans this morning. Gabe pulled the plug on four more companies, which means I have four mountains of paperwork to wade through. He nodded to the table. Breakfast is ready. Marco had made enough food to feed a small army, far too much for the two of us. Plates of bacon, sausage, scrambled eggs, hash browns, and toast crowded the small surface. The breakfast looked delicious, but my stomach wanted no part of it. Instead, I zeroed in on the vase of hand-picked irises. What's all this? Can't I spoil my wife? He winked. Nice try, wise guy. Yes, but there are three places set. Who's joining us? I invited Hildy to hang with you today. I thought you could use some company besides Cyril and that smelly dog. He glanced at the clock. You might want to hurry. She should be here any second. And you're just now waking me up? I was going to, but I couldn't do it. You were so cute and snuggled up. He curled his hands beneath his chin and batted his lashes to mimic me. I glanced around in a near panic. The place is a mess. Make the bed. I'm on it. Go get dressed. The bubbly purr of a boat motor sent me running for the bathroom. I plowed through my morning routine of teeth brushing and face washing in record time. Voices echoing from the front of the cabin made me smile. He was right. I had missed contact with the outside world. Not to mention, I had questions about everything from how to cut an onion without crying to how to get the mud stains out of Marco's jeans. I threw on a pair of mostly clean shorts and t-shirt and hurried back to the kitchen. There she is. Hildy hugged me tight enough to crush my ribs. It's so good to see you. You too. I glanced at the sofa and cringed. He'd put the bed away, but he hadn't bothered to tuck the sheet or blanket in. Bits of fabric stuck out of the edges. Sorry about the mess. Marco just told me we were having company. Smirking, he set two cups of coffee on the table. She didn't come to see the cabin. She came to see us. I bit back a groan, took my seat, and snagged a piece of toast from the stack. Are Enzo and Shauna still at the mansion? They moved out about a week after your wedding. They're staying at Enzo's. Hildy scooped a bit of everything Marco had cooked onto her plate. Marco's mouth fell open. Thankfully, it was empty. They're living in sin? I bet Ma is having a fit. She dipped her chin to hide her smile. Evelyn isn't happy with much these days, but she'll get over it. In time. Speaking of time, I have to run. Marco piled eggs and meat between two pieces of toast, wrapped it in a paper towel, and kissed me and Hildy on our cheeks. I'll be home before dinner. Text me if you want me to pick anything up while I'm out. Marco. I motioned to the chunks of egg falling out of his sandwich. This is a disaster going to happen. Waiting to happen. He grinned. Yes, yes. I hurried into the kitchen, wrapped his breakfast in foil, and filled a travel mug with coffee. He shoved the food into his briefcase, took the cup, and kissed me on the mouth hard enough to leave me swooning. You're a goddess, but I'm late. 
Go. I swatted his ass for good measure. Marco grinned. Thanks for keeping her out of trouble today, Hildy. She arched a brow. Looks to me like she's the one keeping you on the straight and narrow. Chuckling, he finally left the cabin. I settled into my chair, took a bite of my ice cold eggs and forced them down. You're good for him. I don't think I've ever seen him so happy. She met my gaze. Truly happy, not just pretending to be. Thank you. It meant a lot coming from someone who'd known him his entire life. There isn't much to do out here, but I would love it if you'd teach me some cooking basics. Marco hasn't let me near the kitchen since the lasagna incident. She furrowed her brows. I didn't realize there was plastic wrap beneath the foil. Hildy grinned. That's to keep it from getting freezer burn. Freezer burn? Is that another odd American idiom? When air comes in contact with the food in the freezer, it can make it taste bad. She tilted her head. I don't suppose you had too much experience in the kitchen growing up. None, I sighed. I'm the youngest in my family. By the time I was born, my brothers had made such nuisances of themselves, the staff threatened to quit if my father didn't forbid children from entering the kitchen. Hildy threw her head back and laughed. I should have done the same with the Marchioni boys. Instead, I put them to work when they got underfoot. Needless to say, they learned right quick to stay out of my way. You did them a favor by teaching them how to take care of themselves. Before I came here, I'd never washed a dish. She stared for so long that my cheeks heated. Don't be embarrassed. You can't help the way you were raised. All you can do is learn now and make sure you do right by your own kids. Marco and I had spent the previous eight weeks christening every surface of the cabin. If the changes to my body were any indication, practice did make perfect. However, I hadn't shared my suspicions with him yet. How was it raising six boys? I stood and cleared away our dishes. Laughing, she joined me at the sink. A circus, but I wouldn't change a minute of it. Marco and I both want a big family. She gave me a knowing look. I'd say you're young and there's plenty of time for that, but I suspect I'd be too late. Rather than fib, I smiled and got to work. With Hildy washing and me rinsing, we had the kitchen gleaming in no time. What do you two do out here to pass the time? She seemed to realize what she'd asked and grinned. Besides what all newlyweds do. We have a routine. Work in the mornings. He has legal matters to attend to, and I'm designing a new clothing line. In the afternoons, we sit out on the dock and soak up the sun. Pretty much, that summed up our lives together. Every now and then, Marco would go to New Orleans for a meeting or to pick up hard-to-find supplies. Those days, I visited with Cyril. I'd show him my newest watercolor paintings, and he'd share the latest Bayou gossip. Otherwise, Marco and I lived in a bubble of ignorant bliss and sex. Lots of sex. Sometimes we go fishing, and I hike with the neighbor. I walked into the living room and motioned for her to take a seat on the lumpy sofa. She seemed surprised. You have neighbors? One. He lives about a half a mile away. Laughing, I said, Marco had a run-in with a snake shortly after we came here. He refuses to go hiking with me. Grinning, Hildy shook her head. I was shocked when he said he was coming out to the bayou. He's been afraid of snakes and spiders since he was a little boy. I know, I laughed. I remember one time we were playing in the olive grove and Marco's ringtone filled the air. Oh, geez. He forgot his phone. Honestly, I don't know how he survived before we were married. Hildy laughed. Shaking my head, I checked the number on the screen and noted the New Orleans area code. Hello? The line was quiet for so long, I thought the person on the other end had hung up. I glanced at the cell to make sure the call hadn't dropped. Hello? Nicolina, this is Evelyn Marchioni. 
Is my son available? Until recently, I'd considered Evelyn a surrogate aunt. When I was a child, she'd graciously welcomed me into her home and treated me like one of her own, distant but present. The tone of her voice told me her feelings had changed. Marco isn't here. He's at the office today. You can try him there, Evelyn. I glanced at Hildy to make sure she'd heard me say the woman's name. Somehow, I didn't think Evelyn Marchioni would be thrilled to learn her employee was visiting her outlaw son and daughter-in-law. We've become Bonnie and Clyde, hiding from our parents like a couple of criminals. Hopefully, we won't go down in a storm of bullets. Please tell Marco I'm coming to New Orleans at the end of the week for Enzo's birthday. His girlfriend is throwing a surprise party, of all things. I would very much like to see the two of you there. I'll tell him. It was strange speaking to her again. So much so, I let my curiosity get the better of me. How is Papa Joe? He's dying, Nicolina. The stress you and Marco have caused this family is speeding up the process considerably. I gripped the back of the couch. I'm sorry, that wasn't our intentions. Hildy rested her hand on top of mine. Have you spoken to your father? Evelyn sounded as if she was smirking on the other end of the call. Not since before we left for our honeymoon. What was I thinking? I should have hung up after she asked to speak to her son. I wanted to throw the cell to the gators, but I had a sinking feeling our time here would soon come to an end, with or without the phone. Honeymoon, right. She let out a polite chuckle. Are we really going to play this game, Nicolina? My mouth went dry. What does she know? It's not exactly luxurious here, but we're happy. You don't have to pretend with me, she chided. I'm not pretending. I love your son, and he loves me. I glanced at Hildy and sighed. She pressed her lips together and shook her head. Evelyn said, regardless, this so-called marriage of yours has caused a considerable amount of trouble for your family and mine. Pacing the room, I tried to calm my spinning head enough to ask coherent questions. If the Abruzzos fall, which family will take their place? She laughed, the same humorless laugh as I'd heard from Enzo countless times. That's the billion dollar question. I honestly have no idea. I wanted to believe her, but I didn't trust her. Evelyn had spent too many years plotting and planning with my father. She had to have some idea. Her sharp voice pulled me out of my thoughts. What will it take to convince you and my son to come out of hiding? Her bluntness shouldn't have surprised me. Much like my father, the woman made a career out of speaking her mind, issuing orders, and expecting those around her to fall in line. I drew a breath and chose my words carefully. My father's word, he will honor my marriage and not stand in the way of Gabe's plans for the Marchionis to leave the Cosa Nostra. Evelyn sighed far too dramatically for my liking. Nico, you of all people should know it's not that simple. It's irresponsible to walk away from your duties without making sure the people who depend on you are taken care of. She's baiting me. But why? What can she possibly hope to gain? In this situation, I disagree. That's your right, but you should know. Your father and I have come to an agreement. Marco will take Gabe's place. It's time you both return to Sicily. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. My blood turned to ice. I'll speak to Marco about the party and, and, and the rest. Goodbye, Nico. I do hope you will make the right decision. She disconnected the call. Hildy stood and embraced me. My goodness, you're pale as a sheet. Sit down, I'll get you a glass of water. 
I needed to talk this through, but I wasn't sure how much, if anything, Hildy knew about the Marchionis. Do you know why my father and Evelyn wanted me to marry Enzo? She pressed her lips together. They wanted him to take over the business. My father had gone to great lengths to keep his employees from learning about his dealings. Sure, some of them knew bits and pieces, but none would outright admit it the way she had. Hildy must have picked up on my confusion because she said, don't look so surprised. Evelyn and I talk, or she talks and I listen, but not much happens in that house without me knowing. The Marchionis do things very different than what I'm used to. I sighed and took her hand. Now that I am married to Marco, they want him to take Papa Joe's place in the Fratellanza. I wasn't happy when Gabe stepped in, but he's as slick as a greased pig. Enzo wanted it, but he wouldn't have lasted long. He has a tender heart. She tightened her grip on my fingers. But Marco, Marco will do well, too well. Hildy was obviously as worried as I was, but she made no sense. What do you mean, too well? His attention to detail is what makes him a good attorney and businessman, but my heart raced. He'd spent countless hours trying to figure out who was buying pieces of the Marchioni Corporation and had refused to give up. He's going to ask too many questions and not stop digging until he gets the answers. Hildy nodded. These aren't the kind of people who appreciate others knowing their secrets. Oh my God, she's right. I'll talk to him, get him to promise me he won't accept the position. Even as I said the words, I knew what his answer would be. He'd do it, he'd step in, not because he wanted the power, because he'd take the opportunity to set things right with my father and finish the job Gabe started. I could see the future laid out before me. A big house, workaholic husband, and more funerals. Many more funerals. Chapter 27, Marco. Nick, for the hundredth time, I don't wanna take over for Gabe. I grabbed her face and planted a kiss on her lips. She deadpanned. Your mother can be persuasive. My mother can bitch all she wants. Nothing is going to change my mind. We'd argued about her conversation with my mother for three days. I was sick of talking about it and frustrated that my wife wouldn't let it go. She walked into the kitchen, took the antacids from the cabinet and frowned. Can you pick up some more of these on your way home? Stomach bothering you again? I'd offered to take her to the doctor a week ago, but she'd refused. It's the greasy southern food we've been eating. I'm not used to it. She raised her chin as if daring me to argue. I held up my hands. No problem, I'll stop at the store tonight. I had a hunch her condition had more to do with our baby making practice, but she obviously knew more about female reproductive systems than I did. Nico nodded and glanced toward the window. Ciro's late. We're on bayou time. People down here don't believe in clocks. Are you sure you'll be all right? I hated to leave her behind, but taking her to the quarter was out of the question. I'd received a call from one of my father's men in Trapani earlier in the day. He had it on good authority, Giancarlo Lazio and his personal security team had boarded a private plane in the early morning hours. I made a call to my guy in IT, and an hour later, I had confirmation Nico's sibling was en route in New Orleans. Marco, for the hundredth time, I'll be fine. She mimicked my voice before draping her arms over my shoulders. There's no way my brothers can find us. We've lived here two months, and we still have a hard time finding our way back to the cabin. This party is going to suck without you. I placed one hand on the small of her back and held hers with the other. Singing her favorite Ed Sheeran song, I spun us through the tiny living room. When I get home, we're going to turn the lights down low and dance naked. Only if you sing to me. She melted against me. Anything for you. I brushed my lips across hers. I'm looking forward to it, but you're going to be late if you don't go soon. I frowned at the clock. That's the shitty part about surprise parties. You have to be on time or you look like an asshole. Nico laughed and followed me onto the porch. Be careful. 
You too. Stuart, the head of my personal security team, met me on the floating dock. He nodded to me and smiled up at my wife. I'll take good care of him. Don't worry. Thank you. Nika rewarded him with a smile. It shocked me when he spoke to her so casually. Security rarely addressed anyone except the person who'd requested their services. Then again, Stuart had been my bodyguard since Joe's murder. He knew I was far less formal than my father, or even Gabe. Cyril's boat rounded the bend, followed by a double-fingered, ear-piercing whistle. She waved to the crazy Cajun like a kid at a Mardi Gras parade. Love you, babe. Nico's expression softened. I love you too. I gave her one last smile and headed for a different marina. It was a pain in the ass to get to, and twice as far but with the lot seals looking for us, a little caution seemed warranted. Sir, we have word the plane touched down an hour ago. We have people on them. Thanks, I tied off the boat. We need to hustle, I'm running late. He nodded and led me to the SUV. Given the situation, it would be wise to put a team on Mrs. Marchione. Climbing into the back seat, I said, the Lazio brothers aren't the brightest bulbs in the tree, but they aren't going to bother my mother. He grinned. I was referring to the other Mrs. Marchione. You were the first person besides the priest to call her that. It's going to take some getting used to. I had to laugh at myself. Nico's safe tonight, but I'll think about it. Stuart didn't seem convinced. She'll be fine, he muttered. Yes, sir. There were several problems with having a team in the bayou. The biggest being, there was nowhere for them to sleep, and I'd be damned if I had two or three guys camping out on our floor. I spent the hour and a half drive to the quarter catching up on emails, enjoying the quiet and missing the hell out of Nico. However, the silence ended when we turned the corner onto Dumaine. Cars lined the street, and people filled the sidewalk in front of Enzo's building, which had more to do with tourist season and less to do with the surprise party. Stuart slowed, likely looking for a place to drop me. I spotted Dante heading inside and my mother stepping out of a town car. While I would have loved to catch up with my brother, I planned to avoid alone time with Evelyn at all costs. Circle the block. Better yet, circle the whole freaking quarter. She's seen you, he nodded toward my mother. Sure enough, Ma stood on the sidewalk with her arms folded, glaring at the SUV. Logically, I knew she had no way of knowing which of her sons was inside, but I swore the dirty look was for me. Shit. Stop here. I climbed out, but by the time I walked around the vehicle, my mother had gone inside. Let the games begin. Inside Enzo's condo, my mom stood ramrod straight with her arms folded and lips pursed. Draping an arm over her shoulder, I said, Lighten up, Ma. It's a party. She huffed and took a step away from me. There are no decorations, no food, nothing. Go look outside. I glanced at Shauna and bugged my eyes to make her laugh. She didn't as much as crack a grin. Instead, she chewed her lower lip and watched my mother. Evelyn walked to the courtyard doors, surveyed the area, and strode to Shauna. It's wonderful you're doing this for Enzo, but he doesn't care for people to make a fuss over him, nor does he like surprises. Thank you for your advice, but I disagree. She turned and smiled to an elderly woman who just entered. If you'll excuse me. Marriage had given me a new perspective on my family dynamics, especially my mother. I'd always seen her bossiness as a way to keep control of six rowdy boys, but we were grown men. Grown men with wives and girlfriends, and in Gabe's case, children. Lately, I saw her behavior as rude, but more than that, desperate. For what, I didn't know. I waited for Shauna to greet the newest guest, and rested a hand on her shoulder. Sorry to interrupt, but I need to talk to you. Sure, what's up? I glanced around the room and lowered my voice. Nico's father sent her brothers to bring her back to Sicily. For her safety and mine, I won't be coming into the city again until things settle. She whispered, you should have a security team with you. Unless the Lazios follow me to the cabin, no one will find us down there. Shauna's gaze locked on my left hand. Congratulations, when did that happen? A couple of months ago. I'm surprised you didn't hear about it. And a little hurt. Then again, we hadn't exactly sent out announcements. Enzo and I have been keeping to ourselves. That I could understand. Less drama makes for a better relationship. Truer words. She gave me a quick hug. I'm happy for you, but you might want to take off your wedding ring before your mother has a coronary. Oh, shit. I forgot all about it. Thanks. I slid the band into my pocket. Ma already knows, but most of the people here don't. I'd rather not make a scene at Enzo's party. She smiled. Are you too happy? I shrugged and tried to play it cool. 
It's complicated. Shauna motioned to the new additions to the otherwise masculine decor, namely her things. Enzo and I are living proof that complicated can work. When are you leaving? I'll stay until the guest of honor arrives, but I need to get back as soon as possible. She hugged me. Be safe and call me if you need anything. I'll need a map, but I'd be happy to bring you supplies. Thanks. Don't tell Enzo until after the party. I don't want to argue with him on his birthday. I turned and headed for the courtyard. I heard the big news. How's it going? Maggie stopped me before I reached the door. I hadn't seen her in almost three months, and Lord Almighty, she'd changed. Her belly had swollen to the size of a beach ball. Good? Better than good. It's great. I patted her baby bump. You sure you only have one in there? Gabe joined us. Hey now, are you calling my wife fat? I held up my hands and backed away. I'm slow sometimes, but I don't have a death wish. A shadow crossed his expression. I heard about the Lazios. Do you have security? Excuse me. Maggie stepped away and joined Shauna by the door. Puzzled over her reaction, I watched her go. They'd been married three months, but she was already behaving like a good mafia wife, leaving at the first mention of business. It made my stomach turn. Two in from the marina, we're safe at the cabin. He frowned. Any idea what Ma's doing here? She didn't come with you on the jet? I couldn't imagine our mother flying commercial. No, and I'm not thrilled she left Pops alone. You don't think she came in with the Lazios, do you? He started to say something, but Dante slung his arm around my neck and dragged me away by the head. Cut it out. What are we, ten? Laughing, I slipped from his grasp and gave him a half hug back pat. Listen to you, already sounding like a boring old man. He elbowed my side. You look good, though. Marriage agrees with you. I hugged him again. Thanks, bro. I'm happy. Really happy. And I owe it to you for giving me so much shit I followed a woman halfway around the world. He winced and scratched his ear. Had I known the dumpster fire you were about to create, I would have kept my mouth shut. I glanced away. Of all my brothers, I was closest to Dante. That he could be so flippant about my marriage hurt more than I cared to admit. That didn't come out the way it sounded in my head, he sighed. You know I'm happy for you, but I hope it lasts. There's a lot of bullshit going down. Thanks, I think. Everyone, Enzo's almost here. Time to hide on the patio. Waving her arms over her head, Shauna said, stay out of sight until I bring him outside. Dante and I joined the rest of the guests in the courtyard. I couldn't help but feel nostalgic. The last time my family had thrown a surprise party had been for my brother Joe's 18th birthday. He'd figured out what was going on and ruined our fun by showing up an hour early. My mother had thrown a tantrum and sworn off surprise parties. I could have really used my oldest brother's advice right about then. He'd always been the most level-headed of us, even when he'd knocked up Rebecca before he was old enough to drink. He'd handled it like freaking Gandhi. Zach, Joe's oldest son, stood in the center talking to a girl I didn't recognize. Before I could puzzle out who she was, the teen kissed her. Holy shit. Zach has a girlfriend. I nudged Dante's side. Look at that. They grow up so fast. He pretended to wipe tears from his eyes. Asshole. Joe's younger two, Chloe and Ryan, darted past us with cupcakes in each hand. They went straight to my mother, who held Gabe's daughter in her arms. The thought of having a house full of rugrats with Nico made my throat tighten. She could be pregnant right now. Your biological clock ticking? Dante gave me side eye. Yeah, it is. I walked away. Leo stood with his friend, Dahlia. He gave me a curt nod and whispered something to her. How can he stand it? How can he pretend he isn't in love with her? How can he act perfectly normal, surrounded by kids, knowing he has one out there somewhere? I shook my head and looked away. Stupid SOB. It's all going to come back and bite him in the ass one day. Enzo walked outside with Shauna tucked close to his side. Everyone yelled, surprise! My brother startled too dramatically and laughed too loud. He knew. He knew about the party. I laughed. Some things never change in this family. Enzo kissed Shauna like it was his job. I'm talking backward dip, tongue the whole nine yards. Dante nudged me and motioned to her brother, the world's worst actor. I winked and folded my arms. Gabe and Leo nodded their agreement. Dante shouted, he's faking it. The guests groaned and the kids booed. Enzo took a bow. All right, all right. I knew about the party, but I have a surprise or two of my own. 
Poor Shauna looked like she wanted to run inside and curl into a ball. At least she did until Enzo dropped one knee. Holy shit, another one bites the dust. Dante loosened his collar. I should propose to Nico. Do it right this time. Make a big to-do. Straining to hear what Enzo had to say, I whispered, hush. Enzo said something about the cat, and I frowned. Not getting any pointers from him. My mother moved to my side. I need to speak to you. Is she freaking serious now? Without taking my eyes off the couple, I whispered, later. Now. She tugged my arm, but she would have had better luck moving a boulder. I leaned close and whispered into her ear. Your son is proposing to his future bride. The least you can do is pretend to care. Shauna had her hands pressed to her mouth and tears running down her cheeks. My mother pinched the back of my arm, a move she'd perfected when we were kids to keep us in line. It hurt like hell, but I refused to react. Not that long ago, I thought it was funny that my brothers and I could make her so mad she'd resort to a bit of violence. Now, it just pissed me off. Shauna said, yes. I cheered and clapped my hands with the rest of our friends and family. Even Evelyn gave the couple a weak golf clap. Enzo stood and spun Shauna in a circle. You've made me the happiest man in the world. Gabe shouted, Enzo, you forgot something. The idiot forgot the ring. The fact I laughed was proof positive I needed my brothers. Sure, they pissed me off 75% of the time, but I could always count on one of them to do something ridiculous. Cursing under his breath, he set Shauna on her feet and pulled a robin's egg blue box from his pocket. The couple whispered back and forth before he slid the ring on her finger and kissed her again. Once again, everyone cheered. Please, everyone enjoy the food and drinks. I need a moment alone with my fiance. Enzo pulled Shauna into the house. My mother stepped in front of me and planted her hands on her hips. Will you speak to me now, or do I need to book an appointment with your secretary? I'm starving. Let me get some food in my stomach before you lecture me on what I should and shouldn't do with my life. I'd never spoken to her like that, and frankly, a part of me hated it. However, I come here to celebrate Enzo's birthday, not to deal with more bullshit. Evelyn, always one to have the last word, shouted over the noise of the crowd. It's rude to eat before the guest of honor. My brothers, niece, and nephews groaned as if choreographed. I turned back to her. I'm not taking the position, Ma. Let it go. She sighed and slumped her shoulders. I figured as much, but that's not what I wanted to speak to you about. No. I set my hand on the small of her back and guided her to a quiet corner. Then what? If this is about my marriage, you can save your breath. Marriage, Evelyn chuckled. You've had a crush on her since puberty, but Nico wanted no part of you. Ma, I glared, hoping she'd take the hint and shut her mouth. Don't ma me. Can't you see? She only let you take her to bed because she's desperate. I turned on my heel and strode away, rather than risk cursing at my own mother. You deserve better, she grabbed my arm. Marco, please, we have more important things to discuss than your marriage. The sarcastic tone she used when she said the last word stopped me in my tracks. What the hell does she know? I'm listening. Evelyn met my gaze and blew up my world. Pietro is missing over a million dollars in cash. He's brought the thieves back to Sicily for justice. Blood whooshed behind my ears. Thieves? Alessio and Maria Grasso. You remember Maria? She was Nico's nanny. This can't be happening. Nico is going to lose it. But they haven't worked for him in decades. Ma, Enzo's taking forever. Why can't we eat? Dante whined. She waved him away without taking her eyes off me. We both know they didn't take the money, but Pietro's men found it in the house where they were staying. Ryan, my four-year-old nephew, tugged her sleeve. Nana, I'm hungry. Go tell Uncle Enzo. She sighed and turned back to me. You know what happens to thieves in our world. I saw where this was going without her drawing me a freaking map. Yeah, I do. Next, you're going to tell me I have the power to stop their executions. There were rules in the mob. Don't hurt women and don't steal were at the top of the list. Along with, never spill our secrets and don't kidnap people. It was perfectly acceptable to kill them, but taking someone against their will and holding them for ransom was frowned upon. Go figure. Evelyn had the grace to look away. Gabe clamped a hand on my shoulder. Come with me to get Enzo before there's mutiny. 
I didn't trust myself not to say something to my mother that had earned me a trip to the confessional and a month's worth of penance. Sure. Once we were out of earshot, Gabe said, What the hell did she say to you? I gave him the gist of it. He tightened his jaw. Smile. Pretend everything is copacetic for Shauna's sake. We'll handle this first thing in the morning. I'll handle it. I walked inside and flashed a happy freaking smile. Enough sucking face. We're starving and Ma won't let us eat without you. Enzo flipped us the finger. Go away, I'm busy. What was that you said to me before my wedding? Tapping his temple, Gabe turned to Enzo. I remember now. You called me a sap and asked if I was sure I was ready to be tied down the rest of my life. Funny how the tables have turned. You are a sap, Enzo grinned. Did you see tears on my face out there? Wait until she's walking toward you wearing a wedding dress. Gabe said as he and Leo pulled Enzo away from Shauna. Flashbacks of Nico in a white dress hit me like a sucker punched to the gut. I'd made vows to protect her, but I was helpless to honor them. The news is going to hurt her, but the remedy is going to destroy us. Chapter 28, Nicolina. Smoke poured out of every window of the fishing cabin. The stench of burning plastic mingled with the night blooming jasmine made my stomach turn. I placed my hands on my thighs and leaned forward to stop the nausea. Cyril hadn't stopped laughing since we'd fled to the dock. Cher, you sure know how to do it upright. I glared, which would have been more effective had I not been bent in half. I told you I don't know how to cook. He held his hands up in mock surrender. Easy now, we'll try again, but next time we won't be leaving the spoon and dish rag so close to the fire. I righted myself and glanced toward the moss-draped trees on the far edge of the water. How soon can we go back inside? In the months Marco and I had spent at the cabin, I hadn't once looked over my shoulder for my brothers. Now that I knew they were in New Orleans, I couldn't stop. Stroking his beard, he glanced up at the windows. I reckon it's aired out by now. Saint, come. I patted my leg, but the old hound dog didn't as much as lift his head from the wood planks. Cyril whistled and pointed up the stairs. The dog let out a braying bark and bolted for the door. The Cajun caught me staring and laughed. Don't take it personally, he's stubborn as an ox and deaf as an error. Snakes are deaf? I followed Saint. Hell if I know, and I don't intend to ask one. He nudged my side. Get it? Ask one? If they're deaf, they won't hear me anyway. Laughing, I shook my head. I can't decide if you're really funny or if it's because I don't understand what you're saying. English isn't my native language. He winked. Some say it in mine either. In the kitchen, I rinsed out the pan while Cyril picked bits of burnt plastic spoon from the stove and cleared away the charred rag. Once we'd cleaned the mess, he pulled the bacon grease from the fridge. Remember how I taught you? Nodding, I set the pan on the burner. Would you mind if we don't tell Marco I melted a spoon and ruined three pans of roux? He arched a brow. I hate to tell you, but I think he's gonna figure it out. The smell's lingering more than a fart in church. Now that was funny. I melted the grease and added the flour in small increments. Cyril handed me a wood spoon. This one won't smell quite so bad if you torch it. I smacked his arm with it and stirred and stirred and stirred until the roux turned peanut butter brown. Perfect chair. Now add the holy trinity. I dumped the diced onions, celery, and bell peppers into the pan and continued to stir. Cyril leaned close and drew a deep breath. That smell always reminds me of my babette. Your wife? I glanced at him, but he pointed back to the pan. Never take your eyes off the roux. He folded his arms. Babette and I were married 40 years. Cancer took her last spring. I can't imagine losing someone after spending so long with them. Do you have children? Cyril and I had spent quite a bit of time together. He'd loved to talk about other people's families, but never said anything about his own. I'd assumed he'd been single his entire life. We have four, 
They all move to New Orleans, but they come back now and then to visit. He forced a smile. Time for the garlic and spices. Dumping the herbs in the pan, I said, it must have been hard raising four kids down here. We lived up in Baton Rouge until they were grown. This time when he smiled, it seemed genuine. I miss those days most of all, the chaos of it. I couldn't put it off any longer. I made my mind up to ask Marco to stop at a 24-hour pharmacy and buy an early pregnancy test on his way home from New Orleans. Cyril continued chatting, seemingly unaware of my inner turmoil. Being a parent was the hardest and most rewarding job I have ever had. But that's enough of that. We have a lesson to finish. I followed his every command until I had a pan full of what he called Creole gravy. Tomorrow, I'd add shrimp and rice. I couldn't wait to see Marco's face when I served his favorite dish. Marco walked through the door. What smells in here? Dang it, so much for asking him to stop by the store. That depends. Are you talking about the burned plastic or the shrimp creole? I turned to embrace him, but stopped short. His hard-set jaw made my pulse quicken. We should shut the windows. I will when the smoke clears. What's wrong? Marco glanced at Cyril. Thank you for keeping her company, but would you mind giving us some privacy? My pleasure. He met my gaze. You know where I am if you need anything. I gave him a quick hug. Thank you for the cooking lesson. He whistled for the dog, nodded to Marco, and left. My mind raced with every possible scenario that would cause my normally laid back husband to seem so concerned, but all roads led back to my family or his. Talk to me. He guided me to the couch. There's no easy way to say this. Okay. My stomach churned again. His frown deepened. Just know Gabe and I are going to fix it. Fix what? I forced myself not to shout at him, to tell him to stop stalling and tell me what had happened. Your father knows someone emptied his safes. He stared, as if waiting for me to understand. It's been months, I'm sure he's known I took the money for a while. Marco shook his head. He's pinning the robbery on Alessio and Maria. What? This has to be a joke, a cruel, unfunny joke. I laughed. That's ridiculous. They had no way to get into the house, let alone know the codes to open the safes. He continued to stare. Say something, damn it. His men found the money at Maria's sister's house. Marco cleared his throat. He had them taken back to Trapani. My hands flew to my mouth. No, I'm going to fix this. He said it like he meant it, but what could he possibly do? I shook my head. I'd brought this trouble down on them. I'd make things right. This is my fault, all my fault. I shouldn't have involved them. Marco sighed. Nick, you couldn't have possibly seen this coming. I need to talk to Maria's sister. Shaking and unable to think straight, I searched the cabin for my phone. Here, use mine. He handed me his cell. The number is on the screen. I dialed. Hello? Maria's sister sounded as if she'd been sleeping or crying or both. Rosa, this is Nico. Tell me what happened. The woman burst into tears. Men came. They destroyed my house looking for the money you gave Maria. I could barely get the words out. Was anyone hurt? No, Alessio agreed to go with no trouble. She drew a shaky breath. Maria, she was so scared. Alessio too. I worry. They are old. Their hearts can't handle the fear. Me too, Rosa. Me too. I'm going to tell my father I took the money. I'll make sure they are safe, I swear, on my mother's grave. She mumbled a prayer. Thank you. I disconnected and handed the phone back to Marco. You aren't going anywhere near your father. He stiffened his spine. I'll handle this. 
How? By beating him at his own game. He folded his arms. I'm sick of our parents manipulating us. I'm going to give them what they want and use it to stop this bullshit once and for all. The truth behind what he hadn't said stole my breath. No, you promised me. You can't take the position. You can't, not now. Nick, if I don't do something. Marco tried to hold me, but I pulled away. Don't you say it, don't you dare. I stood and paced the room. He was talking nonsense, and I needed to figure out how to help Maria and Alessio. I couldn't begin to imagine how terrified they must be. I'll agree to take Gabe's place on the condition your father release the Grassos. You don't want that life, and neither do I. I'd dreamed of the moment I'd tell him we were expecting a baby since I first realized I'd missed my period, but I'd never imagined it quite like this. I opened my mouth to speak, but he cut me off. Male voices and heavy footsteps on the dock filtered in through the open windows. Marco's eyes widened. He placed his finger to his lips and motioned for me to get down. Nicolina, I know you're up there. Come outside and talk to me, and no one will get hurt. I would have recognized Giancarlo's big mouth anywhere. My heart lodged in my throat as I dropped my hands and knees. My brother wouldn't kill me, that much I knew, but I wasn't so sure if he'd hesitate to put a bullet in Marco. Technically, murdering a member of another ruling family required approval from the others. However, my father was never one to let rules get in his way. Besides, killing wasn't the only thing they could do to him. There was a wide spectrum between being dead and wishing you were. Marco eased to the floor and reached under the end table for the gun Cyril had lent me. If they see he's armed, they'll shoot him and claim self-defense. Shaking my head, I mouthed, no. Marco checked the rounds. I'll distract them, run to Cyril's and hide. Are you crazy? There's one door, Giancarlo shouted. Nico, don't try my patience. I'd hate to mess up your husband's pretty face. Marco whispered. Use the emergency ladder in the bathroom window. He could have the place around it. We didn't have time to argue. Sooner rather than later, my brother would come in and drag us out. It's too dark back there. For once, I was glad he'd refused to turn on the floodlights for fear of attracting bugs. I stared from Marco to the gun. Give that to me, you get help. No freaking way. He kissed me quickly and crawled toward the front windows. Go. Not without you. Marco glared, and I glared right back. He rolled his eyes. Fine, let's do this. Giancarlo continued to shout from the front of the house. You have two minutes, Nico. Two minutes to come outside or we're coming in. We made our way to the bathroom. Marco peeked out the window and scowled. I can't see anything down there. That's probably a good sign. They'd have flashlights, right? Maybe. He slowly unrolled the rope ladder. You first. Ah, uh ah, -uh. no way. So you can turn around and create a distraction. Is this really the time to start bickering? He arched a brow. I folded my arms. It's a good thing I love you because you're starting to piss me off. He kissed my cheek before handing me the gun and climbing out the window. I stood and squinted into the darkness. If anyone or anything rushed him, I'd have no qualms about shooting first and identifying the body later. If I was pregnant, I had no intention of raising the child alone. I waited until the ladder stopped moving, ejected the magazine and stuffed it in one pocket before stringing my belt through the trigger guard. The last thing I wanted to do was accidentally shoot myself, my possible unborn child, or my husband. My hands were so sweaty, I slipped a couple of times on the way down the ladder. When I reached the ground, Marco pulled me toward the path leading to Cyril's. When we were a safe distance away from the cabin, I stopped and whispered, wait, let me reload the gun. Why is it unloaded? He crouched and tugged me down with him. I gave him a hard look. He sighed, just hurry.
I managed to get the magazine back into the pistol when a flashlight beam blinded me. I found them! A man I didn't recognize called over his shoulder. He had his hand on his gun, but mine was in my palm. I had the advantage. More shouting came from inside the cabin. Giancarlo must have made good on his word and gone inside to get me. I raised the pistol. Put your hands up. The guy laughed. I fired a shot close enough to his head that the bullet would disturb his hair. His hands went up into the air. Christ, Nick, what are you doing? They already know where we are. Without taking my eyes off the armed man, I said, I'm going back with them, but I need you to run. If my father gets his hands on you, I don't know what he'll do. I'm supposed to run away while they take you hostage? Bullshit. No, you're going to take Gabe's place and demand my father return your wife. There are rules about how women are treated. Use them. Marco leaned closer. No, you were right. We don't want that kind of life. We don't always get what we want. I have you, and that's enough. I stepped forward to put some distance between us and hopefully to stop an oncoming argument. The sickening crack of something heavy smashing into bone filled my ears, followed by a body hitting the ground. A split second later, a gun barrel pressed against my back. Drop it. The man stood close enough I could smell the garlic on his breath. With a pistol dangling from my fingers, I held my arms out to my sides, crouched, and set the gun on the path. I glanced behind me to Marco to make sure he was still breathing. He lay on his side, just outside the flashlight beam, but there was no mistaking the blood soaking the side of his head. Please be okay. Please, Mother Mary, look after him. I reached for him, but the man grabbed the back of my shirt and forced me to stand. Walk. He jammed the gun into my back again. Giancarlo, tell your men to stand down. I'm willing to talk. That's wise of you. My brother's smug tone grated my nerves. The guy shoved me. Move, keep your hands up and mouth shut. Though it killed me to leave Marco behind, I did as he said. Giancarlo stood on the dock under a pool of light. He held his hands up as if to show me he meant no harm. I'm here to take you back to Trapani. Will you come willingly or do things need to get uglier? Tears stung my eyes, but I blinked them away. I couldn't afford to appear weak. I will, once we've discussed terms. His jaw tensed. Where is Marco? Your soldier assaulted him and left him for dead. My stomach twisted. There were any number of creatures in the swamp who would love to find easy prey. Are you prepared to answer for murder if you leave him out there helpless? He glanced past me. He's a big boy, he'll be fine. You can't be that stupid, Giancarlo. I shook my head. Our father intends to see him become the new capo of the Marchioni family. If you leave him unconscious for the alligators, there will be hell to pay. Bullshit, Giancarlo spat on the ground. Gabe is running the family. Not for long. Call Papa and ask him. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Go get my sister's so-called husband and put him in the house. Two of his men turned and headed for the path. Giancarlo gave me a hard look. Get in the boat. I will, once you answer my questions. I swallowed hard. Are you the one who took Maria and Alessio Gracio from their home in Canton? His eyes widened a fraction before he smoothed his expression. Yes. It stunned me that he'd admit it outright. Why? You had to know they didn't steal the money. He hitched a shoulder. It was a means to an end. You are needed in Sicily. How did you treat them after you took them from the house? A wave of nausea hit me out of nowhere. I pressed my hand to my belly and drew deep breaths. What do you mean, how did I treat them? Did you lock them up in the cargo hold or shove them around like you did that flight attendant? I'd told him I was on the plane for two reasons. I wanted to know he hadn't hurt the Grassos, but more importantly, I needed him to know I had dirt on him. 
Our father didn't tolerate mistakes, and Giancarlo had made a big one. This time, he didn't bother to cover his shock. Pushing past my sudden urge to vomit, I said, answer me. No, I would never hurt them, he sighed. Maria was like a mother to us. How can you think I'd hurt her or Alessio? The man taught me to drive, for fuck's sake. Thank you for that, at least. I turned and stared as the man carried Marco upstairs. He hadn't come around, and in the light, the blood on the side of his head seemed much worse. I swayed and took a step back to remain upright. Giancarlo moved to my side and wrapped his arm around my waist. Relax, it's just a little blood, he'll live. I'm going to... Bending forward, I emptied the contents of my stomach onto the dock. Holding me upright, my brother pulled my hair back with his free hand. Jesus, Nico, you aren't pregnant, are you? His words hit me like a bucket of ice water. I couldn't deny it any longer. I think so, Giancarlo tensed. You're full of surprises tonight, baby sister. Chapter 29, Marco. I woke to the glorious sensation of a warm, wet tongue on my neck. Mmm, Nico must have really missed me last night. Last night? Memories of arguing with her, of climbing out the window, of running towards Cyril's flashed through my mind like mini hand grenades. I opened my eyes and caught a lump of reddish-brown fur in my peripheral vision. No, Saint. I bolted upright and immediately regretted it. My head felt as overinflated as a Macy's parade balloon. If said balloon was filled with hydrochloric acid, the hound dog sat beside me with his tongue lolling. Twin columns of drool hung from his jowls like shoestrings. I wiped the side of my face and cringed. The idiot dog had covered me in spit, pinkish, blood-tinged spit. Tentatively, I pressed my fingertips to the source of the ache. My hair was crunchy, and there was a lump the size of an egg just behind my temple. How did I get back here? Where's Nico? Panic set in. I stood too quickly and sank back to the mattress. Whoa there. Cyril appeared as if by magic. Take it easy. You've been out for hours. Hours? I glanced to the closed drapes. The thin lines of sunlight laser beamed my pupils. Where's Nico? Growling under his breath, he turned away. With the man who did that to your head. Right. Gian freaking Carlo. I'd failed Nico. We'd known they were coming. I should have had a security team on her around the clock, but I'd worried about privacy. I'd put getting my dick wet above my wife's safety. Cyril folded his arms and stared at me. Who were they? What kind of trouble are you two in? The ringleader is her brother. Ignoring the pain and carnival ride dizziness, I stood. The place looked like a herd of muddy elephants had passed through. That explains why they carried you inside instead of leaving you as easy pickings for the gators. I suspect that was Nico's doing. I patted my pockets. Any idea where my phone is? He reached into his pocket and handed me his cell. He was mine. Yours is at the bottom of the river, along with the house phone and your computer. Finding Nico was my top priority. I didn't give a shit about losing the gadgets, but he seemed to know a whole lot for someone who wasn't directly involved. You watched them take her and didn't try to stop them? Take. There was no taking. She went with them. He made a sour face. I couldn't understand why she was curled up on the big one. Struggling to understand what he was saying, I held up my hands. Whoa, start over. What do you mean, curled up? The guy had his arm around her, all cozy-like. Nothing he'd said made any sense. Nico wasn't close to her brothers, least of all Giancarlo. Was she injured? Not that I could tell but there was puke on the dock. Cyril shoved his hands in his pockets. Who puked? My imagination conjured up images of Giancarlo's men punching Nico in the stomach. Are you sure the guy wasn't holding her because she was hurt? Look, the whole thing was crazy. I heard a gunshot and came to check on y'all. Saint found you bleeding in the grass. Then two of them carried you inside. I snuck around to the dock about the time Nico got into the boat and snuggled up with the big feller. Right. I stared at the phone, trying to remember any of my brother's phone numbers. You should have your head checked. Between my sluggish brain and my missing wife, my patience wore thin. 
too thin to stand there and explain the situation. I'm not crazy. Nico may have saved my life by agreeing to go with them. Cyril chuckled. I meant that bump on your noggin. Don't have time for that. After three wrong numbers, I managed to get through to Dante. Marchione, my brother mumbled into the phone. Dante, it's me. Giancarlo has Nico. Can you get in touch with Leo? Find out if their plane is still in New Orleans. If so, have him keep it there. Blow the fucking thing up if necessary. He cleared his throat. And if it's gone? I need to know when they left, where they're going, and the name of every son of a bitch on that plane. Also, call a family meeting. I can be in the quarter in two hours. It's easy. Ma's hosting a breakfast to celebrate Enzo's engagement. What the hell? She hates Shauna. Who knows why Ma does what she does? All I know is we were ordered to be at the mansion at 10. My invitation must have gotten lost in the mail. Or she knew I would show up without one. My breath caught. Had my mom set me up? I thought it was strange she'd left my dad in Sicily for a birthday party. It was part of her plan. It had to be. How else could Giancarlo have found us? Before that asshole clobbered me, Nico had told me how to get her back. She'd seen the pieces moving on the chessboard before I'd even noticed the game. I knew what I had to do for Nico and for the Grassos. I want Pops on the phone for the meeting. I'm taking over. Shit, Marco. Do you hear yourself right now? Do it. I disconnected the call before he could argue. Cyril narrowed his eyes. Son, I don't know who you are or what you're into, but I have your back. Good, I need a ride to the marina. I walked into the bathroom and splashed water on my face. I needed a shower, but that could wait. Everything could wait until I knew Nico was safe. I glanced at the mirror and barely recognized my own reflection. Besides the dried blood and dog spit, I had a hell of a shiner. But that wasn't what made me hesitate. The hard set of my jaw and anger in my eyes reminded me of my father. Nico had accused me of having mafia in my blood. Maybe she was right. Maybe she'd hate this side of me. But I'd do whatever I had to do to get her back. Two hours later, I walked into my childhood home in the same filthy clothes I'd worn to Enzo's party. I followed the sounds of silverware and china and voices to the dining room. Dante was right. Our entire fam damily, including the kids, was seated around the massive table. Hildy was the first to notice me. She gasped and pressed her hand to her chest. My goodness. Chloe, my nine-year-old niece, turned and stared. Uncle Marco, you're bleeding. All eyes turned to me. I'm okay, sweetheart. It looks much worse than it is. Shit, this isn't how I wanted this to go down. I met Gabe's eyes, nodded, and headed for my father's office. My brothers filed in behind me. While none of them seemed thrilled, Dante started some kind of staring contest. I looked away first, not because I had anything to be ashamed of, because I didn't have time for games. What the hell happened to you? Gabe folded his arms. Leo leaned close to get a better look at my skull. Jesus, Marco, you really should clean that up before it gets infected. Enzo rested his hip on the corner of the desk and remained quiet. I glanced at Dante. You didn't tell them? I told them about Nico. He smirked. You can tell them the rest. I turned to Leo. Did the Lazio's plane leave New Orleans? Yeah, a couple hours ago. Son of a bitch. Gabe's voice rose. Someone better start talking, starting with what the hell happened to your head. One of Giancarlo's guys clocked me. There's no way they followed me to the cabin. I would have heard their boat. They had to have help. I sank into my father's chair. All four of my brothers tensed, but I wasn't sure if their reactions had to do with what I said or where I'd sat. I'm placing my bets on Ma. The color drained from Gabe's face. What makes you say that? How can you think I had anything to do with what happened? Our mother stood in the doorway with a heartbreaking expression. I almost bought it, but not quite. How did you get to the States? I flew. She glanced at the others. Gabe said, we had the jet. There is more than one plane in the world. She sighed and waved her hand. I came on Delta. I didn't believe her. Perfect. Then you won't mind showing us your boarding pass or a ticket or your credit card statement. Dante held his hands up in a T-shave. We had people watching the Lazio's plane. They would have said something if Ma was there. Not necessarily. Some of them are in her back pocket. Gabe ran his hands over his head. I'd like to see proof. She narrowed her eyes. You would have me prove my words? I'm your mother. 
I absolutely would, because you haven't flown commercial since we were kids. Not to mention, the Lazio's plane landed in New Orleans about the same time you showed up. I sat back and let the fireworks begin. I'd like to see proof, Enzo said. After the bullshit you and Lazio pulled to force me to marry Nico, I wouldn't put it past you. Leo nodded. I'm sorry, Ma, but we know you've been undercutting Gabe's authority for months. I agree, Dante said. I want to see the ticket. I threw the boarding passes away, but I'd be happy to show you my credit card statement. When I prove my innocence, I expect apologies from all of you. I reached down and hit the power button on the computer. You can log into your account as soon as it boots up. Sniffling, my mother dipped her chin. Yes, fine, you win. I came with the Lazios. My brothers all spoke at once, but I remained quiet. She met my gaze. How can you think I had anything to do with you being hurt? I couldn't take any more bullshit from her, from Nico's family, or anyone else who felt the need to give me a hard time about my marriage. I refused to keep her secrets or sugarcoat the truth. Because you and Pietro Lazio want me to take over as cap over the family. Giancarlo kidnapping my wife has forced my hand. A ghost of a smile crossed her lips. She thinks she's won. We'll see how she feels in a couple of weeks. Gabe narrowed his eyes. You're still playing this game after Pops and I both told you to knock it the hell off. Her eyes widened. This is how you speak to your mother? Save it, he shook his head. I, for one, am sick of the bullshit. We don't want this life, and you've done everything in your power to lock us in. Evelyn winced. Not all of you, only one. The rest can walk away, don't you see? I did this for all of you. All of us, Gabe pointed at me. Marco is 26 years old. He's not a mobster. He's an attorney. You're feeding him to the wolves to save the rest of us? I slammed my hands on the desk and stood. Enough. I've made my decision. I will take the position as head of the family. Dante shouted. There are other ways to get your wife back. Leo and Gabe exchanged glances. Enzo sucked a breath between his teeth. Marco, he's right. There are easier ways to get her back. You two are married. There are rules about other men's wives. I wasn't going to sit there and debate my decision. Stepping up as capo gave me more power, and with it came leverage. That will take too long. I'm doing this. I refuse to step down. Are you going to kill me for it? Gabe folded his arms. You and Nico were married in a church by a priest, right? Yes. My head pounded hard enough to blur my vision. He held his arms out at his sides. Then Pietro Lazio has broken the code of honor. I will demand he return Nico at once. It's more complicated than that. I closed my eyes and drew a deep breath to get a grip of my physical pain. Lazio accused Alessio and Maria Grasso of stealing over a million dollars. Leo cursed under his breath. Let me guess, Nico took the money. Gabe frowned. I nodded and wished I hadn't. A slight movement made me see stars. To give Maria and Alessio a fresh start. So she confesses and returns it, or better yet, Pietro can take it out of her trust fund. Gabe rested his hand on my shoulder. I understand what you're going through. When Maggie was missing, I thought I'd lose my mind. But you don't have to be capo to get her back. Let us help you. He's right. You have grounds to demand Pietro Lazio return your wife. Leo forced a smile. Thank God you two married in a church. None of that matters. Our mother sighed and pulled an envelope from her pocket. Marco must become the capo of this family and vow to remain in the Cosa Nostra before Pietro Lazio will return Nico. Of course. I figured she'd have an ace up her sleeve. Nothing she did at that point would have surprised me. Gabe ground his teeth. What are you up to now, Ma? Me? I may have told one little white lie, but I'm not the one who's been lying to you for months. She gave him an innocent smile, unfolded the contents of the envelope, and set the contract Nico and I had signed on the desk in front of me. I jerked away from it. How in the hell had she gotten her hands on the agreement? I struggled to remember the last time I had seen it. Nico. I'd given it to Nico to sign. Evelyn made a show of staring at each of my brothers in turn. You want out of this life so bad? That's fine. Go. But you shouldn't underestimate Marco. He's more like your father than any of you. My world tilted. 
She'd not only set me up, she'd plotted to turn my brothers against me. Before my mother was through, I'd be locked into the position tighter than a camel's ass in a sandstorm. What the hell is this? Gabe grabbed the paper, skimmed it, and tossed it on the desk. The marriage is a sham? Leo threw up his hands. Is this true? You've been fucking lying to us? Dante hung his head. In the beginning, yes. I stared at my mother, wondering how to make the woman who'd given me life pay. But not anymore. We agreed to tear up the contract. I love her. Gabe ran his hands over his head. But you didn't? No, we didn't realize we wanted to stay married until we were at the cabin. I'll tear it up now. He pointed at the paper. That's a copy. Where's the original? I turned to my mother. She glanced at each of my brothers before settling on me. Pietro Lazio has it. Someone in this house betrayed you. Chapter 30, Nicolina. The white plastic stick sat on the bathroom counter, but I couldn't bring myself to look at it. I'd waffled between anger and wonder since Giancarlo had asked if I was pregnant. Anger because I couldn't help but wish I'd told Marco. He should be here holding my hand, sweating out the test results with me. Thanks to my brother, my husband was bleeding and unconscious in the middle of the bayou. The wonder, I felt, kept me sane. I couldn't help but imagine what mine and Marco's child would be like. He or she would have dark hair and olive skin, that much was given. But would they inherit his startling green eyes? Would they be funny and carefree like their father, or more reserved like me? Giancarlo knocked on the plastic lavatory door. Nico, are you okay? You've been in there for 10 minutes. We've been cleared for takeoff. I'm waiting for the results. I'd heard rumors about my brother since I was a little girl. People whispered his name the way they spoke of Luomo Nero, the Italian version of the boogeyman. As a child, I'd gone out of my way to avoid him when he'd come home from boarding school. As a grown woman, I'd done much of the same. Now that I'd spent a couple of hours with him, I wondered how much of the rumors were true. He'd held me while I cried and when I threw up. Not many men would do that, especially not ruthless killers. His voice softened. Open the door, I'll wait with you. I turned the lock. Come in. It's time, but I can't do it. Tell me what it says. Giancarlo ignored the pregnancy test and crouched in front of me. Are you afraid that pretty husband of yours won't be happy with the news? Marco, his name is Marco, and no, that's not it. He will be thrilled. I chewed my lower lip. And you? How do you feel about this? He reached for the stick without taking his eyes off me. I thought I wanted to have a baby, but now that it's a real possibility, I'm scared. I fought hard to keep my tears at bay. I don't know how to be a mother. I've never had one. He flinched, as if I had jabbed a needle into his chest. You had one, a wonderful one. We'd never spoken of our mother, or much else for that matter. But he was the oldest. He'd had more time with her than any of my siblings. What was she like? He drew a shaky breath. You. She was like you. Beautiful, stubborn, and strong. Nodding, I glanced away. Giancarlo checked the test and let out a little shout of joy or surprise or relief, I couldn't tell which. I shrank back from him and the stick. What does it say? It's positive. His expression grew serious. Nico, you don't have to do this alone. The family will support you. Alone? Is he insane? Thank you, but Marco is going to be as amazing a father as he is a husband. The warmth seeped from his eyes. He stood, tossed the pregnancy test into the sink, and folded his arms. We are leaving in five minutes. You should go to your seat. I stared after him, unable to make sense of his ever-changing personality. Pressing a hand to my stomach, I prayed for my unborn child, Marco, and for clarity in handling my brother. After splashing water on my face and pulling myself together, 
I took my seat in the main cabin. Giancarlo watched me clip the belt around my waist. I'd grown up surrounded by security guards. For the most part, I'd learned to ignore them and conduct myself as if they were nothing more than furniture. However, these men were loyal to my father, and given my current predicament, I didn't feel comfortable speaking in front of them. Forcing a smile, I said, I'm tired. Would it be all right with you if I slept in the master suite after we're in the air? Of course. He spoke without sparing a glance in my direction. Will you join me? I caught a couple of the security guards glaring and frowned. I'd like to speak to you alone. Giancarlo shut down their fun with a glare. Yes, we should talk. I let my head fall back and closed my eyes. Images of Marco, unconscious and bleeding, flashed through my mind, and the nausea returned. The stress can't be good for the baby. I have to be strong for both of us now. The aircraft leveled off, and the flight attendant entered the main cabin. As with most of the people who took care of us, she smiled and silently went about her duties. It struck me how much I'd enjoyed learning to do things for myself, and how I'd grown to hate sitting on my ass letting people serve me. I unbuckled, walked to the bar, and reached for a glass. The woman's mouth fell open. Miss Lazio, allow me. It's okay. I can pour myself a ginger ale. Smiling, I said, it's Mrs. Marchioni now. Giancarlo gave me a curious look. Ready for that talk? Sure. I filled my glass with ice and grabbed a can of soda. Can I get you anything? He continued to stare. Marchioni, have you working for your room and board out there in the swamp? I drew a deep breath and swallowed my smart-assed comment. I was being polite, forget I asked. A bottle of water, he frowned, please. I took a water from the refrigerator and walked to the back of the plane. Giancarlo followed me to the master suite and closed the door behind him. Look, I get it. You were in the middle of nowhere with the guy for months with nothing to do but each other, but you can drop the act. Not trusting my wobbly legs, I sat on the edge of the bed. What are you talking about? I know the marriage isn't real. He stared down his nose at me as if he were the judge and jury of my mistakes. It's as real as it gets, Giancarlo. We were married in a church by a priest, and I'm pregnant, so it was obviously consummated. I've seen a copy of the agreement you and Pretty Boy signed before you were married. A rush of adrenaline burst through me. My heart sped and hands trembled and, yes, my stomach twisted as if to wring out the last of my dinner. How is this possible? I remembered signing the contract, putting it in an envelope and sticking it in my pocket. Did it fall out when I was trying on Hildy's wedding dress? Did she betray me? Well, he tapped his foot like an impatient professor waiting for the correct answer an answer I didn't have. You don't understand. You deny it? His nostrils flared like a freaking bull. No, I motioned to the chair. Please sit and let me explain. He folded his arms. I prefer to stand while being lied to. Well, that's great, just great. He's already convinced he knows the truth. I drew a deep breath and told him everything, and I mean, Everything, including Marco's early morning run to the store for condoms. Giancarlo sank into the chair, leaned forward, and rested his elbows on his thighs. Like I said before, you are full of surprises. Unsure if he believed me or if I'd overwhelmed him, I shoved my left hand in his face. Why would he go to the trouble of buying me this if he didn't love me? My brother studied the ring. I knew the second he made the connection by the way he sucked in a breath. I lowered my voice. It's almost identical to Mama's. He took my hand and turned it toward the light. How did he know? I showed him the real thing when we were kids. Giancarlo met my gaze. I'm so sorry, Nicolina. Papa showed me the paper and I thought, it's okay. One good thing has come from all of this. 
I smiled and squeezed his fingers. You're having a baby? Laughing, I said, yes, but I was referring to you and I talking for the first time. He winced and pulled his hand free. I should apologize to you for that too. We all should. I don't understand. We'd never been close, but I'd chalked it up to our age difference. I was a boy when you were born. I blamed you for Mama's death. He hung his head. My throat tightened. On some level, I'd known my brothers hated me because our mother had died giving birth to me. But to hear him admit it cut deep. Then, when you grew older, you looked so much like her, it was hard to be near you without thinking of her. I look like her? I'd only seen one photograph of my mom, and it had been taken at a distance. When I'd asked to see more, my father informed me he'd had them all destroyed because it hurt him too much to see them. If the rumors were true, her death had changed him. So much so, he'd threatened to kill anyone who tried to view her body. Is that why he kept me at arm's length? Do I remind him of her, too? Yes. Even your voice sounds like hers. My brother gave me a weary smile. Can you forgive me for the way I've treated you? I launched myself at him and hugged him tight. There's nothing to forgive. You were grieving. In some ways, we still are. He released me. I should let you rest. Giancarlo, please, now that you know the truth, turn the plane around. My place is with Marco. He sighed. I will, if that's what you want, but I wish you'd reconsider. Maria and Alessio need you in Sicily. You're the only one who can convince our father to let them go. Damn it, how could I have forgotten them, even for a minute? He arched a brow. You curse now? Don't look at me like that, I'm not a little girl anymore. I stood and paced the cabin. You're right, I should speak to Papa in person, but I need to check on Marco. May I use your phone? He hesitated. Please, I have to know he's all right. The stress of not knowing is making me sick, and that can't be good for your niece or nephew. I'd played dirty, but I didn't care. Until things are settled with Papa, you need to be careful. Ask about his health, let him know you're safe, but that's it. Don't say more than you need to. What else would I tell him? I puzzled over his reaction, and then it hit me. You don't want him to know you and I are on friendly terms? It's best if it seems as if nothing has changed between us. He slumped his shoulders. I can protect you as your enemy, but if people believe we have reconciled. You're worried someone will tell our father we've reconciled. What does that have to do with me calling Marco? My heart lurched. There's a spy in the Marchioni family? Someone close to Marco, is that how you found us? I'll call and check on your husband. Get some sleep, Nico. No, I need to tell him about the baby. I need to hear his voice. That's not a good idea. Giancarlo stood, walked to the door, and closed it behind him. I turned the knob, but he'd locked me in from the outside. This isn't a private cabin, it's a prison. Pounding on the door, I shouted, You have to tell Marco! So help me God, if anything happens to him, it's on your head, Giancarlo! My brother's laughter made my skin crawl. Is he pretending in front of his men? Or did he play me? I trusted him with the truth. Did I make a mistake? Chapter 31, Marco. The jet leveled off and our pilot made the required safety announcements. Normally, I tuned Sanford out as he droned on, but after the night and morning from hell, everything grated on my nerves, including the sat phone, which started ringing the second the seatbelt signs turned off. The flight attendant answered the call with the same bullshit smile she'd used to greet us. Which Marchioni are you calling, sir? Gabe set his laptop aside as if he assumed the call was for him. May I ask who was calling? Yes, sir. One moment, please. 
The flight attendant's smile faltered as she turned to me. He refused to give me his name. Thank you. I spared a glance around the cabin. My brothers watched me, but my mother licked her lips and turned toward the window as if nervous. I walked to the master's suite and closed the door. Marco Marchioni. Ah, so it is safe to tell my sister you survived the bump on the head. Giancarlo's laughter made my head ache. You're a hard man to track down. Show no weakness. Be strong for Nico. That'd be because one of your men sent myself for a swim. Put Nico on the phone. The fact my voice came out as solid as it had surprised me. Between seeing double and the lump in my throat, I'd expected to sound like a 12-year-old. She's resting. He went quiet for a couple seconds. No need to worry. She's safe and sound. I want to hear it from her. Big threats from a man who could not protect his wife. Laughter erupted behind him. Threats? What the hell? Is he trying to impress his security team? You're seriously pretending to insult me so your men don't think you're a puss? He laughed again. Try all you want to flush out the rat. You'll never figure out which of your men betrayed you. My brain stuttered. You're speaking in code. Call me pretty boy if I'm right. You pretty boys are all the same, all looks and no brains. I bet you need a guard to hold your dick when you piss. One of my security team is a rat? That's right. It dawned on me this could all be a ploy to throw me off balance by causing me to doubt my men. How do I know I can trust you? You Marchionis make me sick. All that money and you force my sister to wear a secondhand dress on her wedding day? I pressed my hand to my mouth. My God, he's telling the truth. There's no way he could know that. I ran through my personal guards and my blood ran cold. There was only one who knew the location of the cabin. It's Stuart, isn't it? Yes, Giancarlo laughed again. Don't worry, my brothers and I will raise your son to be a real man. I grappled for the nightstand to stay upright. Nico's pregnant. He made a strange half choke, half gasp sound and disconnected the call. Son of a bitch. I hit redial, but the call went to voicemail. After four more tries, I gave up. Gabe knocked on the door and stuck his head inside without bothering to wait for me to answer. Was that about Nico? Yeah. I sat on the edge of the bed with my head in my hands, trying to figure out if Giancarlo was trash talking or if he was sending me a message about Nico. Is she okay? Close the door. I waited for him to come closer and lowered my voice. We have a problem. Stuart is working for the Lazios. He's the one who took Giancarlo to the cabin. Gabe let loose a string of curses. Did Nico tell you this? I relayed the bizarre conversation I'd had with my brother-in-law. I'm going to throw Stuart off the fucking plane. He balled his hands into fists and turned for the door. As much as I'd like to see if rats can fly, I have a better idea. I waited for him to take a seat. We can use him to feed Lazio bogus information. Right, and from the sound of it, Giancarlo may be an ally. He ran his hands over his head. Are you serious about taking my place in the Fratellanza? That depends. I cracked my first smile since Enzo's party. Do I have to fight you for it? Frowning, Gabe sat beside me. Not unless you tell me you intend to play along with Ma's plan to stay in so the rest of us can get out. Hell no. Nico and I both want out. Especially if we're going to bring a child into the world. The thought made me clammy. I talked a big game about knocking her up, but now that it might have happened, I was scared shitless. What's your plan? Gabe motioned in my general direction. Before you answer that, are you okay? You look a little green around the edges. Headache, it's nothing. I looked him in the eye. It's time the other families know Pietro Lazio has been playing both sides. Gabe gave me an odd look. Everyone knows Lazio set himself up as the deciding vote and thinks of himself as the unofficial capo de capi, boss of the bosses, which is why everyone except Lazio and the Abruzzos are willing to let us walk. Us leaving breaks his stranglehold. Well, shit, there goes my plan. I didn't think the other families were aware. Tell me you weren't planning to expose Lazio. Okay, I won't. 
I tried to wiggle my brows, but it hurt too freaking much. How do I get us out without becoming Lazio and Ma's puppet? Gabe bristled at the mention of our mother. You won't have to worry about Ma. I'm going to take her cell, lock her ass in Pop's room, and cut the landlines to the house. If anyone as much as utters a word to her, I'll have them fired. Nodding, I said. We have to make sure Dante and Leo are on the same page. No weak links. Agreed. He rubbed his jaw. As for getting us out, we have to change the vote. To do that, one of two things have to happen. The other families have to vote to remove the Abruzzos from the table. That'll take concrete proof they were responsible for Joe's death. And the other option? We have to take Pietro Lazio down, or we get enough dirt on him to convince him to change his vote. Great. I thought I'd have the perfect blackmail material. I was not only wrong, but naive. I'll figure something out. Gabe clamped a hand on my shoulder. How do you feel about me stepping into a consigliere role? I can guide you while you're learning the ropes. I like the idea of Gabe being my advisor. It had cut my learning curve down considerably. I'd appreciate that. I'm getting the feeling it's best if I keep my head down and mouth shut for the time being. You? Good luck with that. He laughed. I'll send word to the other families about the change in leadership. They will want you in Palermo for the induction ceremony as soon as possible. Ah, yes, the freaking pomp and circumstance of the mob. While I hated everything the ceremony stood for, it was one of the only times wives and other family members were invited to an official meeting. Nico would undoubtedly be there. Not even Pietro Lazio would dare keep my wife from attending, and I'd be damned if I let her leave my side again. I couldn't help but wonder about Gabe's apparent change in attitude. He'd all but insulted me when I said I wanted his position. What made you change your mind about all of this? It'll be good for my marriage. With Maggie ready to pop any day, it'll give me more time with her and the new baby. The mention of popping and babies tied my guts in knots. How did you guys know Maggie was pregnant? The doctors ran a pregnancy test after those psychopaths poisoned and kidnapped her. He arched a brow. Why? During Giancarlo's ranting, he mentioned something about the Lazios raising my son. I gave him a half grin and waved it off. Probably nothing. Sore tits, bloating, tired all the time, lots of puking. He counted the symptoms on his fingers, furrowed his brow as if trying to remember the fifth one. And a one-way ticket to crazy town, crying one minute, laughing the next. Other than eating antacids like candy and gaining a little weight, Nico doesn't have any of that. Gabe rubbed his jaw. You know how these things happen, right? Or do I need to have the always wear a raincoat talk with you too? Two? I remember the girl at the party. Zach's a little young for that, isn't he? I'd rather give it to him too early than too late, he frowned. You stink. Get a shower and some rest before we land. Pops wants to see us before we meet with Pietro Lazio. Something about a problem with the other families. You'll have to wait. We need to deal with Stuart first. Look at you, little brother, already talking like a capo. Gabe winked and left me to my thoughts. I stretched out and closed my eyes, but it was worthless. No way in hell could I sleep. Besides the headache, I had too much on my mind. Namely, not screwing up an already impossibly complicated situation, finding a way to destroy Pietro Lazio, muzzling my mother, and asking my wife if she has a bun in the oven. Just another freaking day in paradise. Chapter 32, Nicolina. I could count on one hand the number of times I'd sat in the saddle-colored leather chair facing my father's desk. The first time, my feet hadn't reached the floor. He'd called me into his office to tell me he'd decided not to send me to boarding school. To my young mind, that meant I'd been handed a reprieve. At the time, I hadn't realized that was the first day of my life sentence. As if to prove to my father and myself I was a grown woman, I planted my feet on the floor and straightened my spine. He pinned me with his dark brown eyes. I understand you have something you'd like to tell me. I took the money from the safes. Refusing to give him a hint of the turmoil inside me, I spoke in a calm, clear voice. 
You mean you stole the money? I folded my hands in my lap. Yes, I stole from you, but I'm prepared to pay whatever is missing plus interest from my trust fund. Nicolina, you know that is not how it works. He motioned for one of the kitchen staff to come in. The young woman set a tray of pastries and espresso on the table near the window. Will there be anything else, sir? My father crooked his finger at me to call me closer. Donna, would you be so kind as to tell my daughter what happens to thieves in this house? If the poor woman's eyes bugged any further, they would have fallen out of their sockets. Mr. Lazio, his frown deepened. Thieves are killed. She dipped her chin. I tried to keep my expression smooth, to not give him the satisfaction of seeing me react, but I was sure I failed. Thank you, Donna. My father turned his attention back to me. She hurried from the room. It amazed me how different life was here than at the Marchionis. I'd always sensed a low-level buzz of anxiety in these rooms, but I'd grown up with it. To me, it seemed normal to live under a cloud of fear. My time with Marco had showed me how different a house full of love could be. I will allow Maria and Alessio to go free, but they are not to leave Trapani. He spoke as if they were no more consequential as an afternoon rain. Why would you keep them here? They will be ostracized. The fact they'd be marked as thieves and traitors to the Lazios would make their already difficult lives impossible. They defied me when they helped you. He cut himself off. I believe the word you're looking for is escaped. I met his steely gaze. What will it take you to allow them to return to America? He smirked. Who says I want anything? I sat back and stared out the window. I knew this game. I'd seen him play it a million times. The more I spoke, the more he'd dig his heels in and wait me out. Once I'd grown desperate enough to make a deal, he'd take everything I offered and more. Your brother tells me he found you living in squalor in the middle of a swamp, and your fake husband was too weak to protect you. I bit the inside of my cheek to keep quiet. His voice rose. You don't deny it? What good will it do? I sighed. You've made up your mind. I'm content to listen to your opinions. He slammed his hands on the desk. You will remain on this compound until the day you die. I pressed my lips together to keep my chin from quivering. I'd spent the first half of my life following the rules, hoping he'd love me. When that had failed, I'd spend the second half breaking them in hopes he'd notice me. I was done trying to please him. I'm married to the capo of the Marchioni family. Marco will not let this stand, and you know it. My father jabbed his finger on the intercom button. Giancarlo, finish it with the grassos. No, please, God, no. My chest burned as if my heart had gone up in flames. Why hadn't I kept my mouth shut? My brother's voice came through the line. You can't ask me to do that. They are like family. I'm not asking, I'm telling. You do it, or I'll have them taken apart piece by piece while the other watches. Something inside me snapped. I believed, with every fiber of my being, he'd do as he said. I'd never forgive myself if I sat quiet while his men hurt Maria and Alessio. He'd win if I fought him, but I'd lose either way. I'll give him what he wants, anything he wants, including breaking myself wide open on his altar to save them. What do you want from me? Name it. I'll give it gladly, but let them go, papa. Let them go. Screaming like a lunatic, I fell to my knees. I'm begging you, please don't do this. Giancarlo said something, but I couldn't hear him over my pulse pounding in my ears. My father smiled a smile that sent shivers down my spine and came around the desk. Setting his hand on my shoulder, he leaned in to whisper, that's better. I could hear my brother breathing on the other end of the intercom. Thankfully, he'd stopped talking. 
My father walked back to his desk and pulled out the damned contract Marco and I had signed. He's going to force me to have the marriage dissolved. I pressed my hand to my stomach and prayed for the strength to let Marco go. His gaze boring into me. He tore the paper in two, stacked it, tore it again, and again, until there was nothing left but confetti. Giancarlo didn't tell him. He doesn't know how I feel about Marco. I gave him my best, horrified expression. Your life or theirs, Nico. That is what I demand. You will remain here, in this house, married to a man you planned to leave. I hung my head, covered my face, and pretended to cry. For the first time in my life, I was glad my father had ignored me. He didn't know me well enough to know real tears from fake ones. As for where Marco and I would live, I'd worry about that another day. Giancarlo cleared his throat. The Grassos? Our father huffed. Return them to their home in Trapani. At least they will be alive. Not free, but alive. My heart broke for Maria and Alessio, but I'd make it right as soon as I could. Yes, sir. The line clicked and went silent. For Christ's sake, get off the ground, Nicolina. He reached for me. I forced myself to remain limp and impassive. Cheer up. As you said, you are the wife of the Marchioni Capo. He smiled again, just as evil as the first. Think about it. A merger between the two strongest families. We will be unstoppable. I thought Gabe and the others wanted out of the Cosa Nostra. I played dumb in hopes he'd share more of his plans with me. He waved his hand. Once that old goat Joe and Gabriel are dead, that nonsense will end. You're going to hurt Gabe? My voice caught. I have no need to do anything to Gabriel Marchionni. He and his father have done it to themselves. They broke the omerta. Bile rose in my throat, and the all too familiar feeling of motion sickness while sitting still returned. I'd warned Marco about that damned statement about the mayor. They violated oath of secrecy. They released family secrets to the media in order to stop the Abruzzos from infiltrating New Orleans. He chuckled. It worked. Abruzzo heads will roll, but so will Gabe Marchionni's. But you control the vote. You can stop this. Think about it. Marco will be forever in your debt if you spare his brother. I hated myself for giving him any leverage against Marco. I only hoped my husband would understand I'd done it to prevent him from mourning another brother. The Abruzzo's place in the Fratellanza is tenuous. They no longer have a vote. Thanks to that stupid American waitress, the balance has shifted and my influence is limited. So that's it? Gabe dies? I needed to get out of there before I vomited on the antique Persian rugs. I'm very tired. May I go to my room? He curled his upper lip and looked me over as if seeing me for the first time since I'd walked into his office. Get some rest and find something to wear besides those rags. Your husband is being named capo of the Marchioni family tomorrow. His wife is expected to be by his side at the ceremony. I'll see Marco tomorrow? I caught myself smiling, but it faded as quickly as it came. I had a problem, and I hadn't seen this one coming. One look at the two of us together, and my father would know we were in love. He'd know I'd duped him. I had to get a message to Marco, or Maria and Alessia's lives would be in danger again. Chapter 33, Marco. Less than three months had passed since I'd sat on the pool deck offloading bits and pieces of the Marchioni Corporation, but it felt like years. Everything had changed, including me. Be it marrying Nico, taking over for Gabe, or the possibility of becoming a father, I didn't feel like the same guy. I'd grown up when I wasn't paying attention, and I wasn't sure how I felt about that. 
In fact, I wasn't sure how I felt about a lot of things, including my most trusted bodyguard selling me out to the Lazios. I pulled Gabe aside before we walked into the villa. Where is Stuart? He's locked up in the garage. His pinched expression told me he wasn't looking forward to the interrogation any more than I was. Let's get this over with. Gabe frowned. And after you have a little chat, what do you plan to do with him? Good question. I have no freaking idea. I'll figure it out once I know why he betrayed me. He grabbed my shoulder and shook me like he used to do when we were kids. It's good that you're honest with me, but not everyone deserves it. I'll remember that. Head high, I walked into the garage like a man who knew what the hell he was doing. At least, that's what I told myself. Stewart sat in a metal chair in the center of the concrete floor. He had his hands tied and head down, like every prisoner in every mob movie I'd ever seen. I stopped a few feet from him and folded my arms. The man I'd trusted to protect me for almost two years burst into tears. I like Nicolina. I never wanted to put her in harm's way. I tried to warn you. I told you to put security on her, but you didn't listen. He's blaming me? I thought the same thing, but I wasn't about to let this son of a bitch turn the tables. How long have you been working for the Lazios? Stuart winced and looked away. I'd spent enough time with him to know I'd gotten it wrong. If not the Lazios, then who? Gabe stepped forward. The Abruzzos? He shook his head. Look, I didn't know what to do. I need this job. She threatened to ruin me if I... She? My mother. He's working for my freaking mother. I turned my back to him and stared at Gabe. It took him a half heartbeat to catch on. You have got to be fucking kidding me. Our mother put you up to this? She's had me reporting back to her off and on since I was assigned to Marco. He stared at his bound hands. I nudged his chair with the toe of my boot. What exactly have you told her? Until the day you flew Nico out of Sicily, there wasn't much to tell other than one night stands and selling off parts of Marchioni Corp. And there it is. The reason my mother would pay someone to spy on me. She'd never wanted us to leave the mafia and had lost her mind when she'd found out we were dumping illegal businesses. Did you by chance tell her which companies we were dumping? Yes. Stuart glanced between us. It didn't seem like a big deal. The sales were public knowledge. Gabe muttered enough curses to earn him a week's worth of Hail Marys and Our Fathers. I'll have Shauna dig into the buyers. Ten to one, she bought back everything we sold. I wanted to strangle Stuart with my bare hands, but like it or not, he was following freaking orders. My mother, on the other hand, would be dealt with. You said there wasn't much to report until I helped Nico. What about after? As little as I could. He shook his head. You have to believe me. I tried to help you. She was calling for information two or three times a day. I had to give her something. Had to, Gabe sniggered. Did it ever occur to you to come to me or Marco about this? She said she'd make sure I never worked again. I have kids and a wife. What was I supposed to do? I held a hand up to Gabe and turned to Stuart. Are you the one who sent the contract to Pietro Lazio? His eyes widened. No, your mother found it and accused me of withholding information. She had my pay cut in half until I proved myself by telling her where Nico and I were hiding. Stuart slumped in the chair. Yes, Ma lied. She stood there with tears in her eyes and fucking lied. Gabe rubbed the back of his neck. The reality of this situation was too much for me to wrap my brain around. She put Nico and me in danger. The side of my head throbbed, and I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen food. However, I had a missing wife, a terminally ill father waiting for me, and a shitload of mob politics to navigate in the next 24 hours. I didn't have time for this. Gabe met my gaze. Are we done here? More than done. I turned for the door. Stuart sat upright so fast the chair nearly toppled. Wait, what are you going to do with me? A punishment fitting the crime. I winked at Gay before smoothing my expression and turning back to Stuart. You're being reassigned. Starting immediately, you'll be my mother's personal bodyguard. The color leached from his face. No, you can't, please. I walked outside without a backward glance. Jeez, from his reaction, you'd think we ordered his death. Laughing, Gabe followed me around the side of the villa. 
Guarding Ma is worse than death. I stopped at the wrought iron fence surrounding the pool. See to it she doesn't cause any more trouble. I've already got her on lockdown, but I'll limit who goes in and out of her rooms. He nodded to the pool deck. Let's go deal with our other parent. I took a seat between my brothers and father and stuttered when they all looked at me as if waiting for me to speak. Pops, you, uh, wanted to talk to us. Papa Joe Marchione had once been a formidable man, a shark in an Armani suit who could charm the underpants off everyone from nuns to starlets. I had a hard time reconciling the guy who raised me with the hunched back man with an oxygen tube in his nose and a blanket across his lap. And then he grinned, and I saw the predator staring out from beneath his bushy brows. If you're going to run this family, you need to learn to speak your mind, even when it's empty. Capisci? Capisco. I tried again. What did you want to speak to us about? As if to prove his point, he wasted no time with small talk. Your investiture ceremony is tomorrow morning. My pulse raced. I'd see Nico in a matter of hours. Family members are expected to attend. Is it wise for all of us to go? Gabe asked. No, it's not. I'm going alone. I'll be fine with security. Damn it, security brought up an entirely different problem. I'd need a new bodyguard fast. Ma's been causing more problems than we originally thought. After 40 years of marriage, nothing that woman does surprises me. We have more important things to discuss than your mother's meddling. I completely disagreed, but chose to pick my battles. You will absolutely not show up for the ceremony alone. I'm not sure I can make the trip, and your mother is under house arrest. She won't be attending. My father deadpanned. Two of you should accompany him, but not Gabe. Why not? Gabe folded his arms. It will raise questions if I'm not there. Pops lifted his chin and dropped a bomb. I broke the Omerta when I released the information about Carter. Nico had warned me this would happen, but she'd also seen it as an opportunity to flush out our enemies. Right then, I had no freaking clue how to flush anything, let alone people who would be calling for my father's death because he'd blabbed about his illegal activities. Leo rubbed the creases between his eyebrows. Does it matter? Are they really going to send an assassin to kill a dying man? Dante's mouth fell open. Our baby brother lived in a constant but comfortable state of denial when it came to our father's lung cancer. How can you be so crass? It's the truth. Leo turned to our father. Pop's expression darkened. It isn't me they want, it's Gabe. My brothers let out a collective gasp, followed by muttered curses. Why me? His voice cracked, and he took a step back as if to maintain his balance. I hadn't seen Gabe so visibly shaken since Maggie had gone missing. Because, like Leo said, Pops is terminally ill, and they will have their pound of flesh. Since you were the capo, and your wife wrote the press release, you are responsible. I hated every word I said, but it was the truth. Pops broke into a coughing fit that silenced all of us. When he regained his breath, he said, Marco is right. How do we stop this? I set my hand on my thigh to keep it from bouncing. By breaking the omerta again, Pops grinned. Gabe threw up his hands and proceeded to pace the deck. Christ, first the bullshit with the Lazios and the Bruzzos, a Ma, now this? Leo went to him, slung his arm around Gabe's shoulders and whispered something I couldn't hear. Shell-shocked, Dante stood and walked to the bar. I moved my chair closer to my father and lowered my voice. Go on. He gave me an appraising look. You've changed. I'm the capo, a married man, and possibly a soon-to-be father. I had no choice. His eyes widened a fraction of an inch before he narrowed them. Does your father-in-law know Nico might be pregnant? Puzzled by his reaction, I said, I don't know, but I doubt it. Pops let out a long, slow breath. He's going to go ballistic. It's none of his business. My words came out more defensive than I'd intended, but this wasn't the reaction I'd been hoping for from my dad. Not to mention, I couldn't give a rat's ass what Pietro Lazio thought about it. He will say some terrible things. I need you to know they aren't true. He shook his head. There have been too damned many secrets. Maybe it's time to share them. 
You're right. It's past time. Squeezing his hand, I said, spill your guts, old man. Pops hacked out a laugh. They aren't all my secrets, son. Some aren't mine to tell, and some belong to your father-in-law. Even better, I nodded. His tone grew serious. You will need to convince one of Nicolina's brothers to go with you to the convent in Riesi. They will need to speak to the mother superior. You've lost me. What does Lazio have to do with nuns? He gave me a patient smile. One of them knows Pietro's secrets. He couldn't have her murdered, so he put her away 26 years ago. Holy shit. Pun intended. How do you know this? He glanced toward the house as if looking for my mom and motioned me even closer. Because I loved her. Whoa, Pops. As angry as I am at Ma, I don't want to meet your mistress. Marco. More coughing stole his words. Something felt off about the entire thing. 26 years ago was around the time I'd been born. Were you cheating on Ma while she was pregnant with me? He patted my cheek. I said I loved her. Not that I was her lover. She was like a sister to me. Besides, she was married to someone else, and so was I. I thanked God that Nico and I had married each other. I couldn't imagine living my life watching her with another guy. He stared out over the water. Not a day goes by, and I don't regret not doing more for her. I visited and sent money to the nuns to keep her comfortable. But I should have gotten her out of that place. At least she was safe there. My father dipped his chin. Yes, she was. But I was a coward. I was too afraid I'd lose her for good if Lazio found out she'd escaped. Unsure what to think of his confession, I whispered. And now? Is it too late to make it right? My father turned and met my gaze. No, it's not. If anything, this is the perfect time. Pietro's stranglehold on the other families is finally loosening. He's desperate. Desperate men do desperate things. I thought of Nico trapped in that house and balled my fist. Pop shook his head. Desperate men make mistakes. Lazio made a big one when he went after your brother. Is he aware you know where this woman is? By the way, does she have a name? Of course she does, but it's her choice whether or not she wants to share it, he sighed. As far as I know, Pietro has no idea we've kept in touch over the years. His ego would never allow him to realize his plan didn't quite work. I felt like I'd entered some sort of alternate universe. We asked for the mother superior and then what? Don't worry about that. She will know what to do. Another coughing fit robbed him of what little energy he had left. My father's full-time nurse came out and wheeled him back inside. Gabe motioned between Pops and me. What happened? What did he say to you? He's sending me on an errand. I stood, surprised by how off-kilter I felt, but I didn't think it had anything to do with my concussion. I'm not sure what, if anything, will come of it, but I'll go. I'll get a security team ready. I won't need them for this. At least I hope not. You don't happen to have Giancarlo's phone number, do you? Leo scoffed. Why would you call that asshat? Because I need him to go with me to Riesi. I spoke plainly as if my explanation should have made sense to piss him off. I might have grown up, but I'd be dead before I stopped enjoying irritating my brothers. Leo glared. My new right-hand man, a.k.a. Consiglietti, pulled out his phone. I'll text you the number. Wincing, I rubbed the back of my neck. I'm going to need a phone, preferably one loaded with contact information. Gave motion to the wrinkled shorts and t-shirt I'd found on the plane. It's a good thing you left most of your clothes here when you went to the States. You're going to need a suit. Hook me up, bro. The capo thing had its perks, but I gladly traded all in to have Nico back by my side. Gabe handed me his phone. Use this while Leo sets up a permanent replacement, and Dante gets your clothes ready. Leo smirked and Dante groaned. Yep, being the head of the family definitely has its perks. Chapter 
Chapter 34, Marco. That old saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, played through my mind. The trouble was, I didn't know which category to place my new brother-in-law. Regardless of what I called him, I had to convince a man I didn't know or particularly like to accompany me to the convent without telling him where we were going or why. Giancarlo picked up on the first ring. Pronto, how's Nico? I planned to introduce myself, fill him in on the bare bones basics, and say whatever I needed to in order to convince him to come with me. However, my mind went blank the second he answered the phone. Marco? He spoke in a hushed tone. Yes, I should have led with that. How's my wife? Worried, he sighed. She asked me to get a message to you. Tell me in person. I had one shot to get this right and no clue how to appeal to him, other than to use Nico as an excuse. I need to meet with you here in Comiso. It's a five-hour drive, and we are both expected in Palermo in the morning. The tiny town tested my rusty knowledge of Sicilian geography, but we could reach Riesi from the villa in about an hour. We'd arrive at the convent late, but nuns didn't exactly keep visiting hours, did they? Giancarlo, it's urgent. Drive to Comiso. We'll fly to Palermo together in the morning before the ceremony. What is this about? Skepticism dripped from every word. Nicolina, of course. I searched for something more to say, some nugget of inspiration to lock him into coming. She's the wife of a capo now. I need to understand how your father runs his household, so I know how to structure my staff. I want her to be comfortable. Shit, that sounded lame. Might as well throw out a net while I'm drifting aimlessly. Since she's going to be a mother. You love her? He made the statement into a question. Come on, man, give me something. He hadn't corrected me, but he hadn't confirmed Nico's pregnancy either. I do. Good, because if you hurt her, I'll cut your balls off and feed them to my dogs. I grinned because that sounded like something my brothers and I would say if we had a sister. You'll come? Yes, but I'm not driving. Meet me at the airport and call me so. Call me from the plane with your ETA. This sounds like a load of horse shit, but I'll be there. Alone. Now you're starting to piss me off, he laughed. Yeah, alone. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would call Giancarlo a friend, but stranger things had happened. Hell, they'd happened today. I arrived at the airport in time to watch the Lazio jet touch down. It struck me as odd they owned a newer and much splashier plane than we did. Considering Marchioni businesses had laundered Pietro Lazio's money for the previous two decades, I thought I had a handle on his net worth. It seemed I was wrong. The doors opened and Giancarlo stepped out onto the stairs. He looked so different without his security team and expensive suit, I barely recognized him. Once again, I felt as if I'd entered the twilight zone. The guy I'd either feared or disliked my entire life seemed like a normal dude. Holding my arms out wide, I walked toward him. Welcome to Comiso. He glanced around as if waiting for my guards to appear out of thin air. You got me here, now what? Now we take a ride. I have an errand to run. We can talk on the way. I motioned to the armored SUV. He gave me a hard look, strode around the vehicle, and climbed into the front seat. I understood his nervousness. I'd probably act a little squirrely if the Italian leather loafer was on the other foot. Sliding behind the driver's seat, I said, How was your flight? Good. How's your head? He motioned in the general direction of my injury. Nothing a couple of aspirin couldn't take care of. I pulled out of the airport and headed toward Riesi. You said you have a message from Nico? Small talk's over, huh? You don't seem like the type to waste time. I glanced between him and the road. He fidgeted in the seat as if trying to get comfortable, or more likely to buy himself time to decide how much to tell me. She's playing a game with our father. I didn't like the sound of that. What kind of game? Long story short, he has the contract the two of you signed before you were married. My mother had told me as much, but I didn't want to tip my hand just yet. I see. He believes forcing Nico to stay married to you is punishment, Giancarlo grinned. She's worried you'll blow the charade tomorrow. With good reason. I had a hard time keeping my hands off her under normal circumstances, let alone after a freaking kidnapping. Thanks for the heads up. I'll make sure to limit the public displays of affection. Glancing at him again, I said, 
How are Maria and Alessio? His shoulders bunched. I returned them to their home in Trapani, but my father has forbidden them from going back to the States. Why do I get the feeling there's more to it than that? Giancarlo frowned. This conversation never happened, right? You have my word. The haunted look in his eyes freaked me the hell out, but I did my best to remain impassive. He wants them close to use his leverage against you and Nico. The big guy stared at his hands. They would be dead right now, had Nico not agreed the two of you would live in Trapani. Like hell we will. The SUV swerved, but I managed to straighten the wheel before we ran off the road. Want my advice? Sure. I didn't give a rat's ass what Pietro Lazio wanted, but I'd take all the advice and insight into the man I could get. My father will destroy anyone and anything to maintain control of the other families. Until you are in a position to bring him down, you should give him what he wants. If you don't, he'll take everything you love from you, one piece at a time. I shook my head. I can't do that. Not if it means sacrificing Nico's happiness. Good answer. Giancarlo smiled his first real smile since he'd stepped off the plane. She's afraid, you know, about the baby. My chest tightened even as I grinned. Is this what parenthood is like? Joyous terror for the next 18 years? She's really pregnant. I saw the results of the test with my own eyes. I should have been there, holding her hand. I'd be damned if I let Pietro Lazio or anyone else steal another moment from us. One way or another, he was going down. Are your brothers really going to walk away from the life? It took my brain a couple of seconds to adjust to the change of subject. That's the plan. I left it at that for a couple of reasons. Leaving the mob was a complicated process involving everything from a change in tax brackets to security concerns. It was too much to get into in the short amount of time we had. Not to mention, I didn't completely trust him. My brothers and I are interested in seeing how it goes. I tightened my grip on the wheel and forced myself to stare straight ahead to hide my shock. While he hadn't outright admitted it, I took the hint. The younger generation of Lazios wanted out, or at least were considering it. Giancarlo glanced at a sign for the convent and furrowed his brow. Where the hell are we going, Marchioni? To see a woman about a secret. I turned onto a dirt road leading to the ancient building on top of the hill. With its thick stone walls and tall, narrow windows, the place resembled a medieval fortress. For all I knew, that's exactly what it was. A woman or a nun. He gripped the dashboard as I navigated the steep terrain. Same difference. I had to tell him the truth before we walked in there, but I wasn't sure how he'd take it. The last thing I needed was another concussion. Your father sent a woman here years ago. My dad seems to think she knows something that can help us. Giancarlo narrowed his eyes. You mean give you leverage? I parked the SUV and pulled the keys from the ignition before turning to him. Us leverage. Me, Nico, you, your brothers. I have no idea what we're going to learn in there. This entire thing might turn out to be a dead end, but I'm curious enough to find out. He scrubbed his hands over his military short hair. You're right. Let's go. Giancarlo strode to the heavy wood door and pulled the chain. Bells rang somewhere inside the convent. The entire thing reminded me of an old movie. I half expected to see Al Pacino with a machine gun on his back right up on a freaking donkey. A nun in a full habit and heavy wooden beads opened the door. She couldn't have been more than four and a half feet tall, and from the looks of it, she might have been around when the place was built. We stood there staring. The nun arched an eyebrow and motioned to her mouth and to us. Right, vow of silence, I grumbled. We'd like to speak to the mother superior. She motioned to herself. You're the mother superior? Giancarlo asked. She nodded. He threw his head back and laughed. What was that you were saying about a dead end, Marchioni? I debated between throat punching him and laughing. Interestingly enough, I had the same reaction to my brothers on a daily basis. Kiss my, I mean, go bless yourself, Lazio. Wide-eyed, the nun pressed her hand to her mouth, stepped back and motioned for us to come inside. Giancarlo and I exchanged glances as we followed her. I whispered, must have said the magic word. Yeah, Lazio. He pressed his lips into a thin line. The mother superior held up her hand, signaling for us to stop before hurrying down a corridor. 
I have a bad feeling about this. He wiped the sweat from his forehead. Same here. We turned at the sound of fast footsteps. A woman with long, dark hair shot through with streaks of silver ran into the courtyard, but stopped short when she saw us. Her dark eyes swept over us several times before settling on Giancarlo. I stared, unable to look away. She was beautiful and familiar, hauntingly familiar. My stomach clenched. My God, it can't be. She fell to her knees, clasped hands held up to the sky. She repeated one word over and over. Grazie, grazie, grazie. Giancarlo took a tentative step forward. Mama? Chapter 35, Nicolina. I had visited the estate where Marco's investiture ceremony would take place many times over the years. It was one of the few properties the ruling families shared, a designated neutral ground where violence was forbidden. The place was massive. Besides the formal hall where the families would welcome Marco into the fold, each capo had a private wing with smaller meeting rooms, offices, and bedrooms. Normally, I loved visiting the beautiful grounds, but that day was anything but normal. Giancarlo and Marco were both over an hour late. I refused to assume the worst, but my fears were getting the better of me. To make matters worse, my father's anger bubbled closer to the surface with each tick of the clock. I did my best to stay quiet and still to avoid his wrath, a trick I'd learned as a child. Where the hell is Giancarlo? He shouted into his phone. The man hadn't stopped pacing the private office since we'd arrived at the estate. Find him. My dress's stiff collar made the back of my neck itch, and my stilettos felt as if they'd shrank a size or two in my absence. Adding insult to injury, I hadn't eaten anything since dinner the night before. My stomach felt like it was digesting itself. What do you mean he took the jet? Why am I only hearing about this now? The veins in my father's forehead bulged. What the hell is he doing in Comiso? Giancarlo went to see Marco? I sat straighter. Pietro turned and glared. Do you know why your brother went to visit your husband yesterday? Perhaps the Marchioni jet is out of service? I hated how timid my voice came out. I wasn't a scared child anymore, but I had a role to play. A role that would keep people I loved alive. He scowled. You will call him. Oh, shit. He's not going to like this. I swallowed hard. I would be happy to, but Giancarlo's men destroyed mine and Marco's phones. Pietro wiggled the receiver in his hand at me as if I were too stupid to realize there were other telephones in the building. I only know Marco's cell number. He strode across the room, grabbed my arm, and jerked me to my feet. You're lying to me. Instinctively, I put my chin on my chest, curled my shoulders forward, and wrapped my free arm around my middle. He raised his hand as if to strike, but stopped when footsteps echoed on the marble floors. You will take your hands off my wife. Marco strode into the office. Pietro shoved me back into the chair and turned toward him. Who are you to speak to me in that tone? Marco pushed into my father's personal space. If you ever touch her again, I'll cut your fucking hand off. I held my breath, praying one or the other of them would back down. There were armed guards within earshot, and unless protocol had drastically changed, Marco had been searched for weapons before he was allowed to enter the estate. We were defenseless. Pietro motioned to Giancarlo, who'd remained near the doorway during the exchange. Get him out of here. My brother folded his arms and leveled a glare at our father. I agree with Marchionni on this one. You have no right manhandling Nico. You walk in here an hour late and speak to me like I'm a dog. He took a step in my brother's direction. I stood and insinuated myself between Marco, Giancarlo, and my father. Papa, please. It was a misunderstanding. Why don't you join the other capos? It's past time for the ceremony to start. Nick, I need you to stay out of this. Marco nodded to the far side of the room near my brother. I stared, unable to make sense of his cold expression. 
Sure, I'd asked Giancarlo to warn him not to be overly affectionate, but he hadn't as much as spared me a glance. Marco met my gaze, and the corner of his mouth lifted. It was a quick gesture. Had I not been staring, I would have missed it. Wobbling on the ridiculous shoes, I crossed the room. The closer I came to my brother, the faster my heart raced. From a distance, he'd seemed irritated, but up close, I could all but feel the anger radiating off him. However, his puffy red eyes troubled me more than his thinly veiled rage. Has he been crying? I whispered, are you okay? He shook his head, a fraction of an inch. A man dressed in an ill-fitted business suit walked into the office. He took one look at Marco and sighed in relief. Mr. Marchioni, you're here. If you will come with me, we need to get started. After I have a moment with my wife, Marco met my gaze, alone. I'll be just outside the door, sir. Please hurry. The corner of his left eye twitched, but he forced a smile and left the room. Nicolina, you will accompany me into the hall. Pietro snapped his fingers as if calling the family pet. She's not going anywhere. Marco glared. My stomach twisted. I felt like the rope in their tug of war, a game I knew my father would win because he'd play dirty. Giancarlo folded his arms. There is no need for Nico to accompany you, father. Only capos are allowed into the ceremony itself. I'll stay with her until the party begins. Pietro growled under his breath. Nicolina, you will, before you say another word. There's something you should see. Marco shoved the phone in front of my father's face. A woman's voice carried through the room, but the volume was too low for me to make out her words. Pietro took a step back. His complexion went from tan to white to an alarming shade of red. He gasped and pulled at his tie. Where? How? What is he looking at? I turned to Giancarlo and sucked in a breath. He wiped the tears from his face. Now isn't the time. I'll explain after I escort our father to the ceremony. I wanted to demand he tell me what the hell was happening that instant. But between the hard set of Marco's jaw and Giancarlo's emotional state, I bit my tongue. I trust you recognize her? Marco slid the phone back into his pocket. Yes. Pietro's voice cracked. What do you want? Name it. Want? Who is this woman? I couldn't make sense of what was happening. We'll discuss that later. Marco motioned to Giancarlo. My brother crossed the room, took my stunned father's arm, and marched him out of the office. Marco waited until we were alone before pulling me into a tight embrace. Are you okay? He didn't hurt you, did he? No, he didn't. I drew in his freshly showered scent, and the world suddenly didn't seem as frightening. I'm tired and missed you like crazy, but I'm good now. And the baby? A wave of disappointment crashed over me. He or she is good, but I wanted to be the one to tell you all of our practice made perfect. I should have been there when you found out we were expecting, but I swear to you. I'll be there for every other big moment. He eased back and met my gaze. Are you absolutely sure you're on board with me going through with this investiture ceremony? I winced before I could stop myself. It's what has to be done, right? More than you can imagine. He sighed and frowned at his watch. Just know, this is temporary. I can't promise we'll be free in six months or a year, but we will get out. We'd only had a few seconds together. I wasn't ready to let him go. I trust you. I'll make sure I keep it that way. He nodded to who I assumed was the man in the ill-fitted suit. Who was that on the phone? Nick, I wish I could stay with you and explain everything. God knows I should be the one holding your hand through what's about to happen, but I'm already late. Marco placed a quick kiss on my lips. Dante and Leo are here. They're going to make sure you're, they're here if you need them. Hold my hand through what? 
He made absolutely no sense. I followed his gaze to Dante standing in the doorway. Marco cupped my cheeks. This is going to be a shock, but I swear to you, everything is going to be okay. I opened my mouth to ask one of the hundred questions bouncing around in my head, but he placed a finger on my lips. Your mother, Vittoria, is alive. What? Is this some sort of cruel joke? I glanced between him and Dante and half expected them to laugh. Giancarlo walked back into the room, wiping his eyes. I'd seen him cry three times in my lifetime. All three were in the previous 24 hours. He choked back a sob. It's true, and she would very much like to meet you. My mother wants to meet me? My voice quivered. Where is she? The guy in the bad suit cleared his throat. Mr. Marchioni, I have to insist you come with me now. Marco pulled me close. Sweetheart, I'm so sorry, I have to go. They'll explain everything. I stood, dumbstruck, as he hurried out of the office. Nico, you should sit. Giancarlo guided me toward a chair, but I stopped moving halfway there. I don't understand. Where has she been? The old familiar feeling of not being enough washed over me. Had she left me with that monster because she didn't love me? Our father had her locked in a convent to keep her from telling anyone he was embezzling money. He caressed my back. And evidently because he thought she was having an affair. My knees went out from beneath me, but he caught me before I fell. You need to sit down. Have you eaten? Shaking my head, I pulled away from him. I want to see her. Giancarlo turned to Dante. She's pregnant. Get her some food before she passes out. Dante gaped like a fish, inhaling air for the first time. I don't want to eat. I want answers. I grabbed his lapels and forced him to look at me. Where is she? With Leo in the Marchioni's private office. He offered me a watery smile. Would you like to meet her? I don't know what to say to her. My heart hammered against my ribcage. What if she doesn't like me? What if she's awful like my father? What if she thinks I'm awful like my father? She asked a million questions about you on the way here. He kissed my temple. I'm sure the two of you will have a lot to talk about. We should go to my family's rooms. It's safer there. Dante stepped closer, sending my already racing pulse into a frenzy. I glanced between them. Stay with me, okay? Don't leave me alone with her until I give you the sign. When you're comfortable, tell me you want a cup of tea and I'll leave you two alone. A slow smile crossed Giancarlo's face, and he nodded toward the door. Ready? No, but we should at least get out of here. Sighing, I followed them through the estate. People filled the hall, waiting to meet the new capo of the Marchioni family. I recognized several of my father's business associates. Three of my brothers turned and frowned when I hustled through the room. I ignored them, along with my aunt on my mother's side and Sofia Abruzzo. We reached the Marchioni offices, but I lingered, unsure if I was ready to face living proof of my father's cruelty. Dante swung open the door before I had a chance to gather my thoughts or my courage. I glanced up, but I couldn't see past the two of them. Standing shoulder to shoulder, they completely blocked my view inside of the room. I rose to tiptoe, leaned to the right and then to the left, but couldn't as much as catch a glimpse of my mother. For a second, I wondered if she'd changed her mind about meeting me. Dante said something to my brother. Giancarlo nodded and spoke in a low voice. Now? They're having a conversation now? I took a step forward. Scusi? A velvety voice cut through the men's conversation. A heartbeat later, a tall, Dark-haired woman elbowed her way between them. She met my gaze and froze in place. 
My hand flew to my mouth. She had my eyes, or I should say, I had hers. The same shape, same color, same thick eyebrows. Chin quivering, she smiled, frowned, and smiled again. Nicolina? I nodded too quickly. Vittoria made a pained sound, closed her eyes, and did the sign of the cross before closing the distance between us. She stopped in front of me and alternated between lifting and dropping her hands as if she didn't know what to do with them. Up close, the gray in her hair and lines around her eyes were more noticeable and more troubling. For me, they were a reminder of the time we'd lost. I couldn't imagine what must have been going through her mind. I'd been a newborn the last time she'd seen me, if she'd seen me at all. Mama, I couldn't take it another minute. I threw my arms around her and buried my face in her hair. My mother choked out a sob and wrapped her thin but strong arms around me. Tesoro mio, my treasure, my sweet treasure. We remained in each other's arms, sobbing until I'd soaked the shoulder of her dress. I eased back and smiled. We should sit, mama. Yes, yes, of course. She glanced at my belly and gave me a shy smile. Your husband tells me you are expecting. I nodded again because I didn't trust myself not to babble like a lunatic about how happy I was to have a mother to help me through the pregnancy. Instead, I turned to Giancarlo. I'd like a cup of tea. He and Dante laughed. Leo stepped closer and rested his hand on my shoulder. Marco is planning to call a meeting immediately following the ceremony. He wants us to join him. Until that moment, I hadn't stopped to think about everything Marco had said or the repercussions. I glanced at the man's stone-faced expressions before turning back to my mother. You're not safe here. Papa had you held prisoner. He'll, he'll kill you before he allows you to speak to the other families. None of us are safe until he is stopped. I must do this. She drew a deep breath. For you and your brothers and my grandchild. I pressed my palm against my belly and prayed we'd all make it out alive. Chapter 36, Marco. In the movies, the hero grinds his teeth or hisses when a blade bites into his flesh. Unfortunately for me, Hollywood got that wrong too. It hurt like a bitch when Tommaso Abruzzo sliced my palm open and forced me to bleed on what looked like a tarot card with a freaking skull on it. Welcome to the Fratellanza. Abruzzo wrapped my wound with a bandage, kissed my cheeks, and hugged me. I glanced at my father over the other man's shoulder. He gave me a quick nod and slow smile. Welcome to the Brotherhood. My son is now my capo. The men in the room, with the exception of Pietro Lazio, laughed and took turns kissing my cheeks. I hadn't endured that much backslapping and congratulatory nonsense since I had scored the winning goal on my college soccer team. When it was my father's turn, I leaned down and whispered, How are you holding up? Well enough to enjoy the fireworks, he croaked out a chuckle. That's my cue. I turned to face the men in the room. Before we join our families for breakfast, I'd like to invite a special guest to speak to you. I believe you will find what she has to say very enlightening. Pietro Lazio choked on his own spit or tongue or disbelief. It was hard to tell which. I object. My father, God love him, flubbed his lips. Shut the fuck up. This isn't a goddamned courtroom. Lazio continued to bellow as I walked to the door, poked my head out and motioned to Leo. He nodded and strode away. Raising my voice over the din, I said, I understand there was a vote regarding my brother Gabriel breaking the Omerta. Mikael Salvo, a capo who tended to side with the Abruzzos, frowned. The vote is final unless there is new evidence. Nodding, I shoved my hands in my pockets. I don't have new evidence. I only want to go on record as saying that my father, I motioned to my dad, and my brother did what they had to do to prevent another family from taking over our territory. 
Tommaso Abruzzo's eyes widened, as if the news surprised him. Odd, considering Tara had told them all Sophia had blackmailed her into trying to take out my entire family. Lazio glared, but there was no mistaking the fear in his eyes. Outside the room, a woman screamed. Everything went quiet for a heartbeat before more people shouted. I lunged for the door at the same time Leo opened it and ushered Vittoria Lazio, Nico, and Sofia freaking Abruzzo inside. Leo gave me a hard look, nodded in the direction they'd come, and mouthed, fucking chaos. The people outside the room might have freaked out when a supposedly dead woman walked into the hall, but the men inside had gone stone still. Even my father stared as if he'd seen a freaking ghost. Tommaso stood. Vittoria? Her gaze fell on him, and she brought her hands to her mouth and nodded. Nico stood on one side of her, Sophia on the other. Between the two of them, I wasn't sure who was more likely to break the no-violence rule. Where? How? Tommaso turned his head toward Lazio. What did you do to her? Pietro had the sense to lower his head. Why don't we have a seat and allow Vittoria to tell us what she's been through? I motioned to the table with a bloody skull card. Tommaso nodded several times, grabbed the closest chair, and collapsed into it. Nicolina, please join me. I'd appreciate your input. I held my hand to her and ignored the surprised expressions of the other capos' faces. Screw them. The times, they are a changin'. She seemed to actively ignore her father as she seated herself. I took her hand and brought it to my lips before turning my attention to Vittoria. Rather than sit, she stood facing her husband with one hand on Nico's shoulder and the other on Sophia's. Pietro had me held prisoner at the convent in Riesi for the last 26 years because I learned that he was stealing from all of you. Lazio inspected his nails as if the entire situation was preposterous. She is lying to get revenge. I gave her to the nuns because she was, she was unfaithful. She betrayed me with him. Pietro pointed at my father. Oh my God, what does this mean for the baby? Nico whispered. Please, tell me your parents weren't lovers. You're pregnant? Lazio's eyes widened. She frowned. Yes. He threw his head back and laughed. Do you know why I never loved you? You are a constant reminder of your mother's infidelities. Giancarlo stood. That's enough. Pietro spat on the table. Enough, enough would be a kick in his stomach to kill the abomination growing inside her. He pointed at Nico. You married your brother. You married your goddamned brother. Vittoria squeezed Nico's shoulder. Joe Marchioni and I are close friends, like siblings, nothing more. Pops leaned forward to meet Nico's gaze. My dear, you have nothing to worry about. Your father could never understand how a man and a woman could be friends. Shell-shocked, Nico turned back to me as if for confirmation. Sweetheart, he's lying. Why would he try to force you to marry Enzo if he thought you weren't his? She furrowed her brow. The discussion went on around us, but I only heard every third word or so. Right then, I was far more concerned about my wife and child than mafia drama. Nico finally nodded and squeezed my hand. Mikel Salvo shouted, Enough! Vittoria, please, tell us about the theft. She drew a deep breath and squared her shoulders. Before he had me sent to the convents, I was responsible for keeping our books. Back then, Pietro collected the dirty money from each of the families and sent it to be cleaned. Salvo nodded. Yes, that is still how it is done. The money is sent to the Marchionis in the United States. I discovered that Pietro had two sets, one he shared with the Fratellanza and a second private record. She chewed her lower lip. When I asked him about the discrepancies between the two ledgers, he became violent. The beating caused me to go into premature labor with Nicolina. Oh, mama. Nico took Vittoria's hand. Hours after I gave birth, I was told I needed to go to the hospital. Her chin quivered. The nanny took my daughter from my arms, and that was the last time I saw my family. Sophia said, he will pay for this, Zia Vittoria. I will make sure of it. The room went deathly quiet. Everyone except Vittoria stared at Lazio with varying degrees of disgust. I'd heard the story the night before, but it didn't make it any easier to hear it again. As her husband, I had every right to send her away. 
he glanced from one capo to the next. When he received nothing but contempt, he slammed his hands on the table. I am not a thief. She's lying. She has no proof. Leo cleared his throat. But we do. The room went quiet again as my brother handed each of them a fat financial report the Marchioni IT wizards had retrieved from Lazio's private computer network, thanks in no small part to Nico. She knew most of his passwords. Tommaso flipped through the pages before pegging Lazio with a glare. You stole from us, led me to believe my sister was dead, and turned my daughter into your personal guard dog. Sophia hung her head at the accusation. I held my breath and waited for her to spill her guts. She was the one person who could potentially save Gabe's ass. Vittoria whispered into the younger woman's ear. Sophia nodded once, cleared her throat, and stood. I thought I was acting with your blessings. I did what I did because my uncle told me the Fratellanza wanted the Marchionis pushed out of New Orleans by any means necessary. Lazio looked as if he'd swallowed his tongue. My father's voice filled the room, strong and proud. There is your proof. My son and I were justified in breaking the Omerta. We did what was necessary to protect our territory. It had been so long since I'd heard him shout, he took me by surprise. I turned to find him sitting taller than he had in months. Vittoria turned and stared at my father as if she'd only just recognized him. Tears filled her eyes, and his too. He winked. She smiled. They drew shaky breaths. The long-lost friends seemed to have an entire conversation in those precious seconds between them before they glanced away. Tommaso winked at me before turning to the others. I motion to dismiss the charges against the Marchionis. They were justified in breaking the Omerta. Remembering Nico's advice to take advantage of the situation to flush out our enemies, I leaned forward to get a better view of the Ricci and Salvo family capos. Both men nodded their approval. While they didn't smile, neither seemed upset by the turn of events. I turned to whisper a thank you to my wife, but was stunned into silence. Dark circles had formed under her eyes and her shoulders slumped. She'd been through a lot in the previous 48 hours. I needed to wrap things up and get her someplace quiet as soon as possible. Unfortunately, Nico wasn't the only one who needed a break. My father broke out into a coughing fit that silenced the room. He shouldn't have come, but once he'd learned that Vittoria had agreed to speak to the Fratellanza, there had been no stopping him. He'd insisted it was worth the risk to see Pietro Lazio get what he deserved. Only that hadn't happened yet. Since Vittoria had walked in, everything had devolved into shouted accusations and tearful confessions. For Lazio's part, he sat ramrod straight, taking it all in, or more likely, looking for an out. I needed to bring the meeting back to order before it was too late. Releasing Nico's hand, I stood. Because my family was targeted, I have the right to ask for justice. All eyes turned to me. That was all eyes except Pietro Lazio's. He'd evidently found something interesting to stare at on the tabletop. Speak your mind. The capo of the salvo sat back and folded his arms. No surprise. Nico had warned me he'd sided against us when Gabe had made it clear we wanted out of the mob. My brothers and the Marchioni Corporation will no longer be considered part of the Cosa Nostra. Abruzzo and Salvo shook their heads, but remained silent. Pietro Lazio took the opportunity to drop a freaking bomb. What my son-in-law isn't telling you is that they have already liquidated the vast majority of their holdings. They can't support our operations, even if we demand they remain. He is a capo in name only. The Marchioni seat at this table is forfeit. My heart stopped. Gabe had ordered me to sell off any business supported by illegal activities. Had he known doing so would put us in serious hot water with the other families? Once again, Leo stepped forward and saved the freaking day. Actually, we've moved the businesses out from under Marchioni Corp and put them under a shell company owned by my mother. Nico sighed. I didn't need a crystal ball to know what she was thinking. For every step toward freedom we took, someone pushed us back three. I resisted the urge to pinch the bridge of my nose. Ma and her freaking meddling had saved our collective asses, but she'd locked me in tighter. Does anyone have any objections to my first proposal? They remained silent. I took that as a good sign. Anyone else want to throw accusations at me, or may I move on? Tommaso Abruzzo grinned. 
by all means. Chapter 37, Nicolina. My breath caught in my throat. Marco had made a mistake, a big one. The capos hadn't agreed to allow his brothers to leave the mafia. With these men, silence did not mean agreement. Before I could warn him, he flashed me a quick grin. Darling, I feel as though I'm forgetting something. Wasn't there someone else your father wronged? Alessio and Maria. I loved this man. Even though he was juggling more than humanly possible, he'd remembered them. Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. He ruined the reputations of two people by accusing them of stealing. He should make a public apology to the Grassos. My father narrowed his eyes. Tommaso Abruzzo nodded. Considering his crimes, I believe that is a reasonable request. I want you to think of them happily spending your money every day of your miserable life. It was petty, but I couldn't resist hitting him where it hurt, in the wallet. Marco cleared his throat and tightened his jaw as if he expected an argument. Pietro Lazio has stolen millions from everyone at this table. We all know what happens to thieves. I smirked, remembering my father saying something similar the day before. He continued to glare at me, but I held my chin high. I refused to allow him to intimidate me ever again. The first rule in our code of honor states we don't hurt women. Doing so is a higher crime than stealing or even breaking the omerta. Personally, I think death is too good for him. I prefer a sentence that is more fitting to his other crimes. Marco motioned to Vittoria to drive home his point. Abruzzo's lips curled into a mean smile. What do you have in mind? I took the liberty of speaking with an abbot. He's agreed to shelter Lazio for the remainder of his days in exchange for an annual donation. It's a small monastery, but after hearing what Lazio did to his wife, the abbot is rather enthusiastic about teaching him the ways of our Lord and Savior. I covered my mouth to hide my smile. I had never been prouder of Marco. He had every right to call for my father's execution, but he'd managed to keep his hands clean while extracting justice. You can't be serious. Pietro stood and kicked his chair against the wall. The other capos ignored the tantrum and spoke amongst themselves. Pietro continued to shout obscenities about his lying wife, Marco, and me, his traitorous daughter, all of which seemed to make their decision easier. Salvo walked to a door on the far side of the room and spoke to the guy in the cheap suit who'd shown me to the ceremony. A few seconds later, armed men came into the room and pulled Lazio out, kicking and screaming like an overgrown toddler. Great. If there's nothing else, I'm taking my wife home so she can spend some time with her mother. Marco squeezed my hand. I had no clue where home would be, but I needed to get out of there and hold my husband. Please, I'd like to come too. Sofia Abruzzo went wide-eyed, as if she'd realized the absurdity of her request. She had, after all, tried to have three generations of Marchionis killed, and played a part in Joe and Rebecca's murders. My mother sighed as if someone had handed her a heavy load. She'd only just returned to find her family split in two. I couldn't force her to choose between me and her brother and nieces, Marco's expression darkened. I shot him a quick look before turning to Vittoria. We'll stay here tonight. I'm exhausted, and I'm guessing Marco hasn't slept in days. You can visit with your family while we get some rest. Thank you, that would be lovely. Marco held his hand out to me. Let's go. I had a feeling he absolutely hated the idea of staying at the estate overnight, but we both had done things for our families the other didn't like. Joe Marchioni cleared his throat. Marco, they didn't agree or disagree with your prior request. Don't walk out of here without their word. I mentally groaned, 
I'd forgotten to warn him. He glanced between the remaining capos. Do I need to call for a vote? Giancarlo stood. Since my father no longer has a seat at the table, as the eldest son, I claim the position as capo of the Lazio family. My first order of business is to vote to allow Marco's request. The older man stared at Giancarlo and Marco. If I had to guess, I'd say they'd seen the future and didn't like it, not one bit. Tommaso Abruzzo glanced between my mom, Sofia, and me, as if weighing his words against our likely reactions. With Marco at the table and the promise that operations will continue as usual, we no longer need Gabe and the others. I say we let them go as a show of our willingness to compromise. Compromise my ass. The way he'd worded his response locked Marco into the mafia so tight Houdini couldn't get him out. I disagree, but I am outvoted. Salvo threw up his hands. Thank you. Enjoy my party. I won't be attending. Marco all but pulled me out of my chair and ushered me from the room. Marco. But why didn't your father get my mother out of the convent? Nico had spent the previous half hour machine gun firing questions. My eyes had glazed over five minutes into the barrage. He was concerned about her safety. I yawned, wrapped my hand around the side of her head, and forced her to rest against my shoulder. We'll get the answers eventually, but you should get some sleep. What he said about me marrying my brother, it makes no sense. If my father honestly believes I'm the result of an affair between your father and my mother, why would he try to force me to marry Enzo? Her voice thinned. He's either lying, or he thinks Enzo isn't a Marchione. My God, should we tell Enzo about this? I couldn't bring myself to consider the possibility for a number of reasons. One, thinking about my mother having sex, in or out of marriage, was gross. Two, Pietro Lazio was a paranoid son of a bitch with a complicated relationship with the truth. I didn't believe a word out of his mouth. Three, if it were true, it would crush Enzo and my father. I'm kidding. I forced out a laugh for her sake. We all look too much like my dad for any of us to be illegitimate. That's true, she sighed. I think Maria knew what happened to my mom. I had the same thought. I'm not upset with her. I mean, I am, but I understand. She was too afraid of my father to do anything to stop what had happened. Maria wouldn't have had any idea where he'd taken my mother. Maria cared for you like you were her own flesh and blood. That's the best thing she could have done for Vittoria. She nodded. I rolled to face her. Since you're obviously not going to sleep, we should talk about what comes next for us. Nico furrowed her brow. How do you feel about being a father? I mean, we spoke about it, but now that it's... Rather than let her work herself into a panic, I pressed my lips to hers. The kiss went from a whisper to a moan faster than the speed of light. Laughing for real this time, I pulled back enough to rest my forehead against hers. I've wanted to do that since I got here this morning. Me too. To answer your question, I'm scared shitless but excited. It's the same for me. She brushed her fingertips over my jaw. I tucked my chin to get a look at her flat abs, glanced back to her eyes, and set my hand on her belly. Are you feeling okay? You were pretty nauseous at the cabin. I wondered if you were pregnant. Her shy grin told me she'd suspected the same thing. I still have morning sickness, but it isn't too bad. I'm also exhausted, starving, and seriously horny, but all of that can wait until after we've had our talk. We can talk while you eat, or I eat you. She smacked my arm. It's rude to talk with your mouth full. God, this woman. What did I do to deserve her? I forced thoughts on my face between her legs from my head and went for a serious topic. All this stress isn't good for the baby. I know. I promise to take it easy as soon as things settle. We have no clue when that will be. You'll take it easy starting now. I kissed the tip of her nose. It's official. You're the Marchione Capo. You did great in there today. I'm proud of you. But you need to watch out for Salvo, Nick. I sighed and brushed her hair from her face. Let me worry about business. 
Don't start treating me like I'm made of porcelain. I'm pregnant, not fragile. I hold my hand up in mock surrender. Sweetheart, I didn't mean forever, just for the next hour. I'm smart enough to know I need that brilliant mind of yours. I feel like I jumped into the shark tank, and I have no freaking idea how to swim. She sighed. You'll learn, in time. Like I said earlier, I know you don't want to be a mafia wife, and you're worried the business will change me. I'm going to get us out, I swear. I'm not upset. I understand your ass was against the wall. Back. My back was against the wall. Laughing, I cupped her butt and pulled her hips against mine. But now that you mention it, I wouldn't mind putting your ass against the wall. Nico made a purring sound in the back of her throat that went straight to my dick. I like the sound of that. But you need sleep. I had said the responsible thing, but I couldn't hide the fact I was rock hard. She wiggled closer. We have time for a quickie. No sex until after you nap. Once again, I'd said the right thing, but my body hadn't gotten the memo. I caught myself grinding against her like a teenager on his parents' couch. She whispered, are you sure? I jerked my hips back and cleared my throat. Yes, we have some decisions to make, like where do we want to live? Personally, I had no idea where we'd end up. My place in the French Quarter was a full-on bachelor pad, not exactly conducive for raising a family. You'll need to be close to Palermo until things settle, but I'd rather make our permanent home in New Orleans. Same here. I want our kid as far away from Sicily as possible. I frowned. What about your mom? Do you want her to live with us? That you thought to ask means a lot, but not really. I'd like to set up a room for her when she visits, but her family is in Sicily. I blew out a sigh of relief. Thank Christ. Nico curled against me and closed her eyes. Less than a minute later, she drifted off to sleep, complete with soft, girly snores. For the first time since I'd left the bayou, I took a quick inventory of my life. Married to the woman of my dreams, baby on the way, two awesome new in-laws. As for my job, I might be a little fish swimming with apex predators, but my brothers were free. After the previous 48 hours, I'd take that as a win. Not bad, Marchione. Not bad at all. Chapter 38, Marco, two months later. It had rained for the previous three days, and from the looks of the sky, the storms would continue. I stared down at people running for cover under the enormous white tent in my parents' backyard and frowned. What the hell was I thinking? Shaking my head, I turned from the window. Dante clamped a hand on my shoulder. I've been asking myself the same damn question since you came up with this bullshit plan. Gabe shoved our younger brother out of the way and helped fix my bow tie. You were thinking about making your wife happy. My point exactly. Why go through all the fuss when you're already married? Dante talked a big game, but he'd taken it upon himself to arrange not only the un-bachelor party, but the cake, flowers, and music. The catering fell into Enzo's capable hands, and the rest of the planning was split between Leo and Gabe, though I suspected they'd enlisted the help of their women. I slid into my tuxedo jacket and took one last look in the mirror. What if Nico hates this idea? Enzo chuckled. Six months ago, she would have, but she's not the same, not a hair out of place designer clad supermodel she was before. I disagreed. She might have given up the sky high heels and the couture fashion, but those things were only the wrappings. Deep down, she was still the girl I'd fallen in love with when we were kids. She was perfect. For me, anyway. Okay, I guess it's time to go ask my wife to marry me and spring a wedding on her. I turned to Leo, who'd remained fairly stoic during the typical Marchione pre-wedding razzing. What time do you pick up the surprise guest? He made a show of glancing at his watch. About now o'clock. I'll walk you out. Sure. I headed for the door, stopped, and grinned at the four of them. Before I forget, thanks for your help. I love you guys. Go. Enzo threw a dirty sock at me. Dante rolled his eyes and Gabe grinned like a proud papa sending his son out into the world. I followed Leo down the stairs. My parents' garden district mansion wasn't my first choice of venues, but it was available and large enough to hold our enormous families. Speaking of fam families, voices carried from the front of the house. 
The last thing I needed was to be stopped by well-wishers. I signaled for Leo to detour us away from the guests and duck out the servant's entrance. By some miracle, we made it out unseen. Any trouble in Sicily? Leo cocked his head. The hard set of his jaw concerned me. He obviously had something on his mind, but I knew my brother. He'd torture himself for days before he finally broke down and talked to one of us about whatever the hell was going on with him. Nope. With Lazio under lock and key, the Capos are pleased with their increase in revenues. He nodded. Ma's behaving herself. I gave him a, yeah, right, look. She's driving Stuart crazy, but he's keeping her in line. I'm thinking about letting him off the hook. Two months is long enough. Isn't that the truth? Speaking of crazy, Leo cracked a grin. Giancarlo was serious about giving back the money his father stole. It'll damn near bankrupt them, but yeah. I pulled my keys from my pocket, but hesitated. I saw the news last night. How's Dahlia holding up since her father announced he's running for president? It's a fucking zoo over there. She's on paparazzi watch 24-7. I'll be amazed if she makes it to the wedding today. He leaned against the limo. You're out now. The company is 100% legal. Why not put yourself and her out of your misery already? I had no doubt in my mind he was in love with Dahlia and vice versa. Hell, they had a kid together. A kid he hadn't bothered to claim. She's seeing someone. He jerked the car door open. I'd expected him to tell me to mind my own business or to fuck off, but I hadn't seen that one coming. Whoa, dude. I'm sorry, is it serious? Hell if I know. He's some blue blood politician her father approves of. Leo hitched a shoulder. She seems happy enough. Screw that. Have you told her how you feel about her? He tapped his watch. Would you look at that? If I don't leave now to pick up your special guest, your entire plan will be ruined. Think about it. Women aren't mind readers. I called over my shoulder as I slid into my cherry red antique Maserati. The car would have to go once the baby was born, but I'd enjoy every second of her until then. Despite the power under the hood, I drove to my apartment in the French Quarter like a responsible adult, mostly. What can I say? I was running late. I told Nico we were going out to dinner at a new frou-frou restaurant she'd been dying to try. We'd get around to it one day, but I was in no hurry to drop hundreds of dollars on a meal that consisted of food that looked like it had been hit with a shrink ray. Tonight, we dine on filet mignon, lobster, and wedding cake. I pulled into the drive and waited while the gate groaned and creaked its way open. I'd been meaning to call the super about getting the damn thing fixed, but I'd been a little busy, running one-fifth of the mob and planning a wedding. For crying out loud, hurry up. I'm right here. Laughing, Nico planted her hands on her hips. Wow. My brain backfired. The woman was carrying my child, but you'd never know it from her slinky black dress. The filmy fabric hugged her chest and hips without revealing as much as a hint of skin, as if it had been spray glued to her body. I thought I'd save a few minutes and come downstairs so we didn't miss our reservation. She hurried to the passenger side, and I caught a glimpse of the back and the dress, or lack thereof. Except for a thin line at the top, she was bare from her shoulders to the swell of her ass. Jesus, Nick, are you trying to kill me with that dress? She slid into the car and ran her hand over her chest. You don't like it? I love it, but it's sexy. Smooth, Marco, real smooth. I couldn't exactly tell her 250 of our nearest and dearest would see her in it. Then again, what did I care? She was absolutely stunning. Like you with this car, I'm going to enjoy it until I'm too round to wear it. I'm not complaining, and for the record, you'll be the sexiest round lady ever to waddle the planet. I put the car in reverse and headed back to the garden district, the opposite direction of the restaurant. I have never and will never waddle. Nico turned and stared over her shoulder. You're going the wrong way. We've had a slight change of plans. My parents are throwing a little get together tonight. I told them we'd stop by before dinner. I avoided making eye contact. The woman could ferret out a lie like a bloodhound on a rabbit. You change the reservations? Pursing her lips, she continued to stare. Yep. I reached for her thigh, but thought the better of it. She'd know something was up if I left a palm-shaped sweat stain on her dress. My dad is doing surprisingly well. He was out of his wheelchair for a while today. That's wonderful news. She sighed and folded her arms. Shit, I'm messing this up. Nick, I was thinking, we should get away before the baby is born. Somewhere tropical, 
Just me and you. No security, no phones, a real honeymoon. We had a real honeymoon in the bayou. Besides, we can't go anywhere without security, now that you're a capo. Once again, she sighed. I opened the glove compartment and pulled out two passports. Maybe not, but Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Fossbender can go anywhere they want. Nico rolled her eyes. All right, Mr. Fossbender, I'll go on a second honeymoon with you, but it might have to wait a few weeks. I sent the designs to some friends in Paris. And? I held my breath, waiting for her to continue. Launching her new clothing line meant the world to her, which meant it meant the world to me, too. They want me in Paris next week for a meeting. She glanced at me as if worried I would tell her she couldn't go. That's fantastic, Nick. I'm so proud of you. I brought her hand to my lips. I could tag along if you want. Kick around Paris while you work, then head to Corsica and soak up some sun. Her eyes brightened. I'd love that. I turned onto my parents' street and frowned. Despite giving everyone specific instructions where to park, some of our guests hadn't followed directions. Nico leaned forward and studied the cars lining the roads. I thought you said this was a small get-together. Small is a relative term. I pulled into the back entrance on the opposite side of the mansion from the tent and pretended my hand slipped onto the horn. Nico startled. What's wrong with you tonight? You seem nervous. Nothing. Does this sound weird to you? I hit the horn two more times for good measure. With any luck, my brothers had heard the signal and were in the process of quieting the crowd. It sounds loud. She shook her head and reached for the door. I love you, babe. My voice came out thinner and higher than I would have liked, but Nico didn't seem to mind. I love you too. She turned back to me and smiled her cover girl smile, and then it morphed into a kiss me grin. I jerked back. We didn't have time for kissing, not yet. Well, okay, now that I got that off my chest, let's go inside. She arched a brow. You're definitely acting weird. What's going on? Nothing. I hopped out, jogged to her side of the car, and opened her door. Nico folded her arms. I'm not moving until you tell me what's going on. I let my head fall back and squinted at the night sky. Damn it. Think, Marco, think. Okay, fine, you got me. Maria and Alessio are here for dinner. I held my arms out at my sides. Surprise! Here? She climbed out. Why on earth would you have them here? Your mother is a complete snob. You're killing me, Nick, killing me. I forced a smile and took her arm. You're right, dear. We walked through the back entrance and into a dark house. Evidently, my family thought surprise proposals and weddings happened without lights. At least the place was completely quiet. Nico stopped walking. Where is everyone? Why aren't the lights on? Maybe the power's out? I tugged her toward the kitchen stairs. She pointed toward the microwave. The clock is working? I missed the first step, cursed, and forced myself to take several deep breaths. Sweetheart, please. I have a really big surprise for you, but I need you to trust me, okay? Nico slid her hand into mine. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Honestly, Marco, for a mafiosi, you can't lie very well. I bit my tongue and led her to the balcony overlooking the garden. The second we walked through the French doors, white twinkling lights illuminated the railing and trees. A handful of strategically placed spotlights lit us and helped to conceal our friends and family below. It's beautiful. Nico turned and gasped when I dropped to one knee before her. I took her hand. I should have done this the first time I asked you to marry me, but, well, I was an idiot. She pressed her hand to her mouth and laughed. Nick, a long time ago I told myself if I ever fell in love, it would be to someone who laughed at my jokes, even the bad ones who wasn't afraid to kiss me in public, who understood why I hated spiders and didn't tease me about it. She laughed again, but this time she did it through her tears. I promised myself I'd marry someone who loved movies as much as I did, who knew when I was bullshitting them and was strong enough to call me out, who accepted my crazy family, who knew my secrets but never shared them. Nico cut my cheek and sighed the sigh that told me I'd done something very right. I stared into her gorgeous brown eyes. The thing is, I promised myself I'd marry you, my best friend, partner in crime, shoulder to cry on, and the love of my life. It's you, Nick. It always has been, and always will be. Will you marry me, again, tonight? 
the lights came on below. For the first time, Nico could see our friends and family standing on the soggy grass waiting for her reply. Maria and Alessio stood arm in arm, waving like a couple of excited children. Vittoria and my father beamed up at us. Even my mother cheered and blotted her eyes. Nico's hands flew to her mouth as she glanced between our loved ones and me. My, how? After what felt like an eternity, she gasped. Tonight? You've planned an entire wedding for us tonight? Dipping my chin, I grinned. I promised you we'd do it again. Yes, you crazy, wonderful man, yes. I stood, lifted her from the floor, and spun her in a circle. The crowd below cheered, and a band started to play Nico's favorite song. When the singer belted out the first few words, she whipped her head toward the sound. Oh my God, is that Ed Sheeran? Yes, it is. I love the way her eyes lit when she was happy, truly happy. Knowing I'd put the smile on her face made every bit of the aggravation and stress of planning a secret wedding worthwhile. How did you get Ed Sheeran to sing at our wedding? She jumped up and down, seemingly more excited about the pop star than her husband, but I wasn't worried she'd leave me for the ginger. A love like ours didn't come around often, and Nick and I were finally smart enough to hold on to it. Humming along with her favorite song, Perfect, I wrapped my arms around her from behind and swayed to the music. A few years ago, he did a duet with Andrea Bocelli. I called in some favors and got his personal cell phone number. Nico turned in my arms and pressed her forehead to mine. You're incredible. So are you. Nico rose on tiptoes and kissed me. Her lips tasted like warm blueberry syrup and promises whispered under the blankets. She tasted like my past, my present and my future. My man Ed switched things up and belted out the next chorus in Italian, thrilling the crowd below and my beautiful wife. Sing to me, she whispered. I pressed my cheek against hers and did my best to harmonize with the man I'd paid a small fortune to perform. Nico sighed that special sigh again and melted against me. When the song ended, I gave her another lingering kiss. Maggie and Sean are inside waiting to get you dressed. I'll see you at the altar. She laughed and buried her face in my neck. You bought me a wedding gown? You know how much I love white dresses. This has been Single Malt Drama, a mafia romantic comedy, Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, book three. Written by Catherine M. Hurst. Narrated by Charlotte Claremont and Aaron Shedlock. Produced by Bookworm Audio. Post-production services provided by Eric Sinestvet. Text copyright 2020 by Catherine M. Hurst. Production copyright 2021 by Catherine M. Hurst. All rights reserved. Be sure and check out Hot Mimosa, book four in the Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club. Thanks for listening.